You're listening to the Discussing the Resilient podcast, hosted by Aidan Smalling and William Reid. Competitive 40k podcast for servants of Nurgle and the Fallen 14th Legion. Tactics, meta-analysis and all things Death Guard. Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of the Discussing the Resilient podcast. Uh, it's a bit of a special one this week. Um, finishing off our uh, sort of coverage of the... Um, London uh, Grand Tournament. Um, so obviously we, we did a, a deep dive uh, live stream on YouTube with Aiden because obviously Aiden went 4-1, uh, but he didn't actually finish top with Death Guard. Uh, he was pipped uh, by uh, a gentleman called Sam Boardman, who uh, we do have on this podcast. I'm going to introduce him shortly. Uh, also, there were some other people went 4-1 uh, as well. Uh, another gentleman called Pierce, um, who Surely, uh, in this episode two, uh, Aidan interviewed Pierce, and we're going to run through a deep dive on his list, uh, sort of talking through the overview of his games. Uh, but before we do that, I'm going to run through one with Sam, uh, sort of similar thing, talking through his list and uh, you know how it went, you know some of the changes he might make. So, uh, without further ado, uh, introducing Sam Boardman. So, introduce yourself, Sam. Sort of, uh, you know, um, tell us about the list, I guess. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, so. The list was a slight evolution. Um, after going to Leeds, I got talking to Aiden, basically had a bit of a chat to him and decided I was taking Death Guard to the next tournament that I was going to. Um, <clears throat> so I came up with the basic ideas of the list um, and then the balance data slate came out, so everything else obviously changed. So I came up with a list that originally had a Hellbrute, um, the Banner Guy, and an extra unit of Nurglings in, but after running it at a tournament, it didn't perform quite how I wanted it to. Um, so that's how I ended up sort of coming to the list. Literally, the day of list submission was the uh, last game that I had at that tournament. Um, so I didn't get much practice with the list. Uh, but yeah, so the list was um, eventually um, two foul blight spawns in a rhino. Um, was two units of Nurglings down from the three that I originally wanted. Um, it was a Land Raider, a Mortarian, Lord of Virulence, Typhus, um, an Italian And then it was two units of Cultists, a unit of 20 Poxwalkers, um, two units of Death Shroud. I think that was it. How big were the units of Death Shroud? Were they three mans or six mans? Yeah, they were just three mans. Um, mainly using them just to sort of screen out areas with their Overwatch. Okay, yeah, makes sense. And so obviously, um, were there some vehicles there as well? Obviously, you mentioned a Rhino. Did you not take a Land Raider too? Yeah, I took a Land Raider. Um, that was sort of what was shoehorned into the list, uh, literally last minute between um, sort of game five at the tournament that I was at before LGT and um, the award ceremony. I was talking to uh, Mike Porter and we had a bit of a discussion and sort of came to the discussion that Land Raiders actually aren't too bad. So that was uh, put in the list and painted up in about three days. <laughs> nice. Um, so, cause was there any Plague Burst Crawlers or anything like that then? I don't think oh yeah, mentioned. sorry, there was three Plague Burst Crawlers. That um, sort of intrinsic to most Death Guard lists, I completely forgot about even mentioning them. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they are pretty, pretty common in most lists at the moment. Yeah. So, um, so, so there was a bit of armour but mainly characters. So, obviously, what we'll talk talk a little bit about the games. But I suppose, as a as a broad a broad overview, how did the list sort of function? You know, what was its what was its main goals? You know, what was the decisions behind some of the units that you that you included? So basically, I was looking at sort of trying to deal as much damage as possible out of a Death Guard list because um, we don't have the highest AP, the highest amount of shots, um, and the most sort of anti-tank so the land raider was in the to give me four las cannons that i could put at things um and then yeah played those crawlers with entropies um allowed me to sort of plink away some wounds and um yeah it was basically about doing the damage and being just resilient enough um with the chaff units to do the missions okay so, and you didn't have any Plague Marines in there, you said, is that right? Or was it just, no, um, no just, just cultists? Yeah, cultists and a unit of 20 Poxwalkers. Okay, and what was the Poxwalkers' role? Were they sort of, you know, supporting Typhus? Did they come as a brick or did the Poxwalkers sort of 
and Typhus operate independently or that change from game to game? So the idea was that it was going to change from game to game, um, but I never actually ended up putting Typhus with the Pox Walkers. They tended to, depending on the matchup, either rush one side and sort of just be on an objective doing actions or just screen out my home field and uh, make sure that that was always under my control. Okay, yeah, makes sense. I mean, I, I, both both pretty good uses for them. And um, so, because obviously you mentioned about the two foul blight spawn as well uh, and, and the rhino. So there was nothing else in the rhino with them. It was literally just two nope, foul blight spawn. Them two, just them two using the two fire parts in the rhino. Ah, oh, nice. Okay, so did the rhino sort of just drive around with them, as you say, shooting out the fire and decking? Did they ever get out or was that not the plan? Yeah, so in matchups where... I'd killed the majority of the stuff um, or I needed an extra little bit of range um, because obviously the Rhino moves it's 12 then you can disembark 3 which gives you over 24 inches of threat range on them Um, so sometimes I was moving up the 12 and I was an inch or two out um, from getting the flames in range so then I'd pop them out um, leaving the Rhino then free to go and do actions or sit in an objective and do whatever it needed Um, or put the characters into the opponent's deployment zone because I went fixed. Um, okay. On all the rounds. Um, what doing were the fixed seconds? There's the main one. Okay, so did you do that in the center or did you sort of, you know, push into people's deployment zones or, or is that what the so, Nurglings were doing? One unit of Nurglings would sit in the center because um, on UKTC there's a ruin just outside of the center objective, which is within six, um, which allows you to do teleport homes and not get shot. Um, <clears throat> then the second unit of Nurglings went into reserve, um, even if they didn't actually manage to score any points on teleport homers. Um, it made some people screen out their deployment zones, which kept certain units sort of back and out of the game Um, so I was never going for 100 point wins Um, I was sort of capping myself around about the 98 to 95 um, in most games but then I'd scout up a unit of cultists who support the Nurglings um, which them two in combination um, if you take the minus one to hit something charges the Nurglings and the cultists and all of a sudden that the minus two to hit so things that are hitting on twos are now only hitting on fours okay that's pretty interesting so did that make the nurglings sort of like a lot more reliable and, and durable then did it yeah so the unit of nurglings that i put in the center of the board um actually i only ever lost that three man unit of nurglings once and that was to a thousand some player who double moved a sorcerer um with the pure intent to get rid of the nurglings Okay, so, so I mean, I suppose that leads us quite nicely into the, the LGT then. So, so, what were the units that you play? Because presumably then you didn't come across Imperial Guard or anything, you know, with, with good outer line of sight shooting because that could have obviously damaged the, the tactic that you've gone for quite a lot if they were able to pick those units up. Or if they had, would you have been able to play, you know, sort of the cards if, you, if you'd needed to? Did you, did you leave yourself that option in those, in those particular matchups? Yeah, so with regards to fixed versus tactical, um, most of the time I went in with a game plan that the cultists and the Nurglings and potentially the Poxwalkers would be scoring the majority of the points. Everything else is either going to sit back and pick off units that need to, uh, like Mortari and the Plague Bursts, or I'm just going to push up into the centre and pretty much just stop dead on the centre line um, and make my opponent come to me. Oh, that's quite clever. So, so you fix Death Guard's mobility problem by saying, I don't actually need to move, you've got to move to me, and then if you don't move to me, I'll just stand here and win. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's pretty interesting. Pretty interesting tactic. So, so you said teleport homeless was one. So what was the second one did, that you took? Was, was it cleanse that you took for your for your second so object? I think it was two out of three game, uh, two out of five games that I took cleanse, and then the others would just depend on the opponent. Um, sometimes I'd take assassinate. Sometimes it'd be bring it down. Um, yeah, it, it basically just depended on sort of what my opponent gave up because. Again, we fixed. It's not necessarily 
choosing ones that you think you're going to score max points on uh, as long as you can get 10 to 15 on them mm -hmm. sometimes you make your opponent play differently um, which gives you an advantage because if you've got let's say grey knights um, and they're looking to throw five characters in your face and you can say right I'm going to kill them five characters um, they then have to start thinking well actually I'm using these to score three points here but then I lose my character and that's four points that I'm losing so they then have to start thinking about the point trading game no, it's, it's, a, it's quite a clever quite a clever idea and, and something that seems quite different from, from what a lot of people have playing and I know we had Innis on a while ago and Innis said maybe he's done something a little bit similar to what you've done but you've kind of obviously put your own twist on it there so so what what did you play at LGT you know what was the, the sort of first game second game if, if you sort of give us a bit of a rundown and talk us in maybe some key moments in those games any sort of uh, swing moments anything where you you know you maybe sort of would have done it differently or you know where the list sort of really shone um, you know sort of if, if you just run from, from round one I guess and, and run run through to five yeah so <coughs> When one was into Grey Knights, and I was actually really dreading this matchup because I played Grey Knights three times with Death Guard before, and every single time they'd used some sort of trick, um, which was a different trick every time to get on my home field objective, and they'd gone tactical and drawn um, capture enemy outpost, and I'd always lost the game by three points, and it was any other card that they drew, um, I wouldn't have lost the previous games so i was going into this game thinking i will not let that home field objective get taken um which is the game where the pox walks and the tallyman just sat on the objective and didn't move until um the very last round so the terminators um in this list were four five man units of normal terminators with various uh, heavy weapons uh, three librarians leading three of the units and uh, Drago leading the fourth unit and then the rest of his list was just one unit of five strikes um, and then a unit of ten paladins with a grandmaster so that you couldn't edit any of his um, stats and once per game he gets a free stratagem so okay. it went sort of how I expected um, for the first couple of turns where he was just darting around all over the place, um, basically making me fire mortars at things. He was going out and killing something um, and then teleporting away when I tried to react to it because he had the sigil uh, and mists of Deimos. So yeah, that was quite a hard one to lock down. Um, how did you find the more... Final. How did you find the most performed? I mean, did, what contation did you take in this one? Did you take the one where you put extra AP on, or were you making them, you know, minus one? To yeah, so you, I went or? for the extra AP just because all the Grey Knights have a two-up saver standard. Um, so the extra AP meant that stuff like Poxwalkers, um, when you use the extra AP strat on them, um, puts Terminators to a four-up in them. And that, oh, that's pretty good. with the uh, lethal hits, is actually quite amazing, uh, which I found out several times um because 50 percent of the hits are going to auto wound so it's it's quite interesting when you go up to a terminator and just go there's a load of four up saves from a hundred point unit box walkers so yeah he oh, went good. backwards and forwards um he took fixed as well um i think he might have taken assassinate and homers um and i think i'd gone cleanse and homers on that one um and it all came down to the last turn. He had basically ignored my um, cultists that were in the centre for the majority of the game. And then turn three, they just thought, well, he's not got anything that's specifically here to take out the cultists. Um, they've done the job in the centre. There's a unit of Nurglings, everything's sticky, you know. <clears throat> I've got that time to push up. So the cultists advanced and rolled a six straight towards his home field objective because he'd stickied it with the strikes at the beginning of the game but didn't have anything on it. Um, so turn four, my cultist moved on to his home field objective and started to burn um, his home field, which obviously is a massive swing at the end of the game. So I knew then he had to react to it and he only had, I think it was two units left. Um, one of them had to grow a Terminator back or to advance six inches. Um, 
and then make his weapons assault weapons so that he could get a millimeter into my deployment zone to do teleport homers. Now, he would still be behind on points doing that. Um, and it all came down to, I think it was Drago in a unit of three Terminators at this point, um, basically deep striking near his home field objective and making a nine inch charge without a reroll, um, which he failed, which ended up scoring me, um, I think it was 10 points for burning the home field objective um, in that oh, mission, nice. which put me, I think it was an 88 to 79 win, so I won by nine points. And it was literally, if he'd made that charge, then You'd have uh, uh, point. cultists had been dead and it'd have been game over sort of thing. So okay. I was like, quite impressed myself on that one because I've just been battered by Grey Knights um, every other game that I've played, but I learned from my mistakes. That's really good. I mean, that's you know, it goes to show sometimes the best thing to do is just get reps and you know, third time lucky. It sounds yeah. like so. I had a question as well um, in regards to that game because obviously we we haven't really mentioned the land raider a little bit. Did you put any of the characters in the land raider? The land raider just was it just was it just a gun platform? You know, did it? You know, what did you do in this game with with that yeah, particular so sort of? Depending on what I needed, um, if I needed the Lord of Erlans to deep strike somewhere to get line of sight, then he'd go into deep strike. If I wanted him stood on the board getting line of sight on something, then he'd do that. Or, you know, if I wanted to quickly get his flame room range, then he'd go in the Land Raider. In this particular game, it was um, Typhus and Three uh, Death's Road that I put in the Land Raider, and he scout moved his. Um, strike squad up and then he got first turn um so because he'd gone for teleport homes he had to use the strike squad within six inches of the center now with land raider's um ability being able to disembark and then charge the land raider was poised right facing the center objective uh, so it moved up its 10 disembark three and then made i think it was like a four or five inch charge uh, into the strikes and took them straight out um, nice, that's so yeah, really the, good, that. the land raider obviously turn that four inch movement into effectively a 13 inch move for the um death road nice and he didn't um and he didn't you know use the strat he had when you disembarked because uh, obviously when you come within nine of um of grey knights they can spend a cp can't they and sort of lift the unit up yeah i um, don't think he was too fussed about me killing them i think he wanted to save his cp for sort of other things um because i think the next turn he deep struck and did the hailed in um Payload in soul fire is it where you basically loan operative strat um to stop me shooting one of his units of terminators ah uh, so we need to save the cp to yeah. do that then and do you because it sounds to me from sort of talking you know from hearing you talk about that game do you think the grey knights player made a mistake in not playing tactical because it sounds like grey knights are really good at that and it sounds like maybe sort of fell into your trap a little bit by trying to sort of take take fix I'm, I'm guessing you would have just hid the characters did you and just not let him get any points on them so i didn't hide the characters i used them to draw units into places that he didn't necessarily want to be um so i put the rhino on one flank um and he took the bait and dropped the paladins and drago squad um and another unit terminators on that flank which just allowed me to sort of go to the rest of the board and start screening out a little bit um, and then he had to fight quite hard to kill the unit of 10 cultists that were hid behind the wall, um, which again just pulled him a little bit out of position. So, because I didn't need to go anywhere other than the mid board, um, and then there was one unit of Nerglings that deep struck in his deployment zone, just did homers. Um, but as soon as I'd got to that point where one unit of Nerglings in the centre was doing cleanse, one unit was doing homers in his deployment zone. Um, I didn't really need to move, so it was then up to him to play a game uh, where I was just scoring points sat there. That's smart. So, yeah, so you, you you basically had the initiative and he had to sort of push him and change the game state to uh, yeah. to sort of... No, oh, that's really, it's really smart, that. Um, so... Moving on to game two, then what did you what did you face there? So I had to apologise to my opponent before even starting game two because uh, it was an orc matchup. Okay. And um, I apologised to him because I basically said you're not going to enjoy this game because um, I've got that many reps in with the cultists and the nerglings um, and the six inch aura on the nerglings for minus one hit in combat. Um, I went for the minus one weapon skill, ballistic skill. Um, 
and yeah basically again just sat in the mid board let him charge me and then he, what would have been hitting on fours is now hitting on sixes um, which fair enough he gets exploding sixes and he did a fair bit of damage but again the mortars were just taking out um, his grots that were sat on the backfield um, you know Typhus and a unit of um, Death Road went straight up into the middle in the land raider disembarked charged a unit and tanked I think it was 20 orc boys 10 knobs and a war boss for nearly wow. three rounds is that just because um, they just couldn't hit them he just couldn't roll enough sixes could he not yeah it, it basically he just every time he went to hit them he was minus two to his hit rolls um, so he was either hitting on fives or fours um, he was getting exploding fives and exploding sixes in various places but yeah he didn't have the AP once he did hit me to really get through the Terminators um, he did end up killing them after I think it was three rounds of combat um, but at that point I basically bogged down half his army um, ended up sacrificing Mortarion in that um, so we charged Mortarion with a unit of knobs and a war boss um, <laughs> took a couple of wounds off Mortarion I think it was about six um, and then Mortarion fell back over the unit because I'd seen in his deployment zone he'd left a nice big space that if I put Mortarion there I'd tempt him to bring his squig hog boys in which is exactly what he did he rapid ingressed them um, moved up charged Mortarion killed Mortarion but I'd set the rest of my army up to be able to see the point that he'd be um, there was nowhere for him to consolidate um, so he had three player bus crawlers stirring straight at him um, I think the rhino was stood there as well and yeah basically took him down to a couple of wounds on his boss in that unit um, nice. after he killed Mortarion so I mean from what you've said said a little bit there with the play burst caller so how did you find them were you quite static with the play burst caller did they just sit in a point and, and shoot or were you actually pushing them to the mid board so they can get the entropy cannons into range how did you sort of how did you play them yeah so I basically pushed them up with Mortarion um because I knew Mortarion would have to be used quite aggressively. Um, otherwise, he'd just take the mid-board and then it'd be me fighting to take it back. Um, so in this game, yeah, Mortarion from turn one was moving up. Uh, the Plague Bus Crawlers got into the centre and then just basically parked up. Um, again, the Land Raider trundled into the centre, threw a unit of uh, Death Shroud out and then just sat there firing LAS cannons at things. Um, yeah, again, a unit cool. of Nurglins went up into because it was the diagonal deployments um, a unit of Nurglings went right up into the centre using rapid ingress and then in my turn moved into his deployment zone to start doing homers so that one was quite a big win I think that was uh, I think it was 98 to it was high 50s low 60s I think he scored so that was a proper blowout um, that was basically let him pulled his home field he went tactical um, and I basically went well I'm going to keep you down on primary I'll stop your secondaries where I can but I'm not going to overextend to try and stop your secondaries um, so did he go tactical on his secondaries did yeah he, he went tactical I, I went I went fixed he went tactical ok nice so and what I wanted to ask as well, what are you what are you doing in terms of the deployment of the land raider? Are you are you just accepting that it goes out in the open and just you know hope for first turn or that it lives through? I mean, because obviously there is some some big movement issues with it, aren't there? If you sort of get stuck behind a terrain feature sometimes, what what, yeah, what so how I'm, are you playing it? I'm sort of thinking about the first two turns with the land raider and nothing after that. Um, so turn one, ideal, I want it to limit what can shoot it there's normally only two places the land raider can set up and move um it's full distance on UKTC terrain um in the first term so it's, it's normally one of them two places and then basically just shoot it up get it into relatively mid board and then it normally either survives and just shoots large cannons at things or dies horrifically by that point but as long as it's sort of taking the heat off Mortarion moving up or play bus crawlers or the Rhino um, again because there's that much damage output in the list that people are worried about um, and again I think it stems from people not really having played Death Guard so they're not 100% sure on the target priorities um, okay. yeah but the Land Raider looks, you take some heat off the rest of the list that then overperforms 
Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's you kind of run it as a distraction kind of effects with some guys inside. And and again, so is, is it just Typhus and the three Death Shroud you, you chucked in there, or did you chuck another character in as well? No, it was just uh, Typhus and the Death Shroud, Mars Games. Nice, okay. Um, so what 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 was game three then? What what sort of followed followed on from that? So game three was against someone that I've spoke to at a lot of the UK TC tournaments, but never actually played. Um, so we had a bit of a laugh beforehand and sort of recognised that it was going to be quite a chill game. Um, so I just explained to him beforehand uh, sort of what tricks I can do, uh, which I do in every one of my games because I don't like winning by gotchas. So one of the biggest ones in this game was I explained to him beforehand uh, about Mortarion not allowing him to zero damage on his saves. Um, so he was like, oh, I'm not sure about that. So we called the judge over before the game and the judge came over, looked at the FAQ. He said, yeah, I agree with Sam. You know, you can't zero a save because it modifies the characteristic. Um, so we got that out of the way and like, right, cool. Okay. So what army was he well, playing then? What, um... So it was Thousand Sons. So we had Magnus, a mono, uh, Mutilith Vortex Beast, a Rhino, a load of characters, um, a couple of units of Enlightened, and then just five-man units and a ten-man unit of um, Flamer Rubrics. So we started okay. off with like 17 Cabal points with some of his stuff in Rhinos. Um, so all in all, he probably had about 20 Cabal points to play with. Um, so we went first, moved up to kill my Nurglings because again I'd gone assassinate and um, teleport homers. So we moved up to kill the Nurglings that were going to be doing homers in the centre. Um, sacrificed one of his characters. So stopped me scoring three points, but then allowed me to score four points on assassinate. Um, so I moved up staging ready for um, turn two. And then I got hit so hard I thought I'd lost the game because um, he managed to kill pretty much all my cultists. Um, the unit of Nurglings that were there, the two characters and the Terminators that they were with, um, and a couple of other bits just sort of plinked off here and there. I think he wounded one of the Plague Bus Crawlers, so I was like, this is not going well. Um, okay. And at the beginning of this game, I decided to outflank the Rhino that had the Foul Blight spawn him. Mm -hmm. um, so at the end of his turn two movement phase, I thought, right, I'm going to have to rapid ingress this. Um, so I rapid ingressed it uh, up onto one of the objectives because it was one of the weird ones where one of the objective markers is oh, within six. only 5.9 away from the edge or something. So you can just to onto it, which meant because he couldn't kill the Rhino because it was the end of his movement phase and he had nothing that could kill it. It became sticky in my turn. And okay. then the rhino got to move off and do what it wanted. So that was sort of like a throwaway, let's see what happens. And yeah, I managed to take that um, sort of top corner objective. That's so really, cool. really, really hard. Um, and I was like, right, I'm going to have to do something spectacular here to uh, pull this back. And um, the Vortex Beast, I took it down to uh, three wounds the turn before and I was like right I need to finish it off um, shot most of my army at it and it was just passing in runs and feeling no pains so I ended up taking it down to one wound and I was like that is not what I wanted but the land raider was one of the last things I fired and I'd already said I was putting the four las cannons into Magnus um, just to try and chip, chip a couple of wounds off because he was doing the majority of the damage mm -hmm. Now, the Land Raider was sat right next to Mortarion. So I fired the four Las Cannons, hit with three, and I thought, I need to try and get all of these like through to try and force some damage through. So I used the CP to reroll um, one of the hits. Then I managed to get all of them through on wounds, because um, I think I, I think I might have rolled two ones on the to wound, but because I was near Mortarion. Oh, you got to reroll re -roll the ones. ones. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So then he, he sort of cockily went, oh, I've got my four up save. Um, I can blank the damage, blah, 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 blah. So he rolled all four dice at once. Um, and he failed all four of his inbuns. Oh, no. So I was like, because he rolled at once, he couldn't point. do any CPs. Exactly. So he said, do you mind if I use the CP? And I was like, 
you know what, it's it's unlikely you're going to roll all four saves. Go for it. You can use a CP. The intent wasn't to kill him anyway. It was just chip a few wounds off. So I'll, I'll let you go back and do it. Because again, we, we'd had a bit of a laugh at the beginning, you know. It yeah, was a nice you weren't... sort of jovial match. Um, and he rolled and he rolled a three, so he'd failed. So out of five dice, he didn't roll a single four up for um, Magnus's saves. So wow. I slow rolled my damage um, just in case I needed to CP any of it. And um, yeah, I managed to completely kill Magnus in one shot from four last cannons from a land raider. Oh, wow, that's pretty good. Then he exploded. Um, and he does d6 mortal wounds when he explodes oh so, does he <laughs> yeah which I didn't know uh, <laughs> I've never had him die in the games I've played against him I've just no. ignored him it's the first time I've played him to be honest um, and he had two units of rubrics with characters stood behind the wall um, one of which was on like two rubrics and a character and one of which was untouched um, so the first explosion did six mortal wounds and put his character down to a couple of wounds because the rhino had moved up to flame that unit um, so I'd already pretty neutered that unit and now he had a character on like one or two wounds left um, the other unit took some casualties and I think that rolled like a five or something so I took him down to sort of like one or two rubrics left in that squad um, and I was like really happy about that and he was like oh, I'm going to have to do some serious work to um, sort of win this and then went over to his um, Vortex B still on one wound and he had a unit of cultists that only had two cultists left um, and they were on an objective so I thought he's probably not going to fail his leadership checks and he every leadership check he took for cultists in that game he rolled a double six for um, so his cultists just didn't care about the fact that they were getting murdered <laughs> Um, so yeah he still held that objective so I was like that's a pain in the ass. that's why I wanted to kill the Vortex Beast and hope that the cultists had failed the leadership check uh, which didn't happen yeah yeah but then he moved his Vortex Beast which was in line of sight of the Land Raider um, so I was like you know what I am going to overwatch he's got one wound left if I can do it that's going to be hilarious so I started off with the Plague Bolter that was on the um Land Raider because if it hits it auto wounds because it's got lethal hits oh yeah yeah um, so I rolled it and I got a 6 with one of the 4 shots because he was in 12 and I was like this could do it and he passed his save and I was like ah. Oh. but then our heavy bolters also have lethal hits so again a hit is a auto wound and a sustained hit so rolled the 6 and I said well just take your save now because if you pass it then um, you know I'll have to roll the other one but if you don't then I don't have to roll this other dice and he failed so I was like oh fantastic I killed the vortex beast and he was like oh it explodes I was like oh okay can't imagine that this one's going to explode as well and he rolled a six so <laughs> that about that also has d6 mortal wounds on the explosion and at this point he pushed everything out because it was the last thing he moved in his movement phase and he pushed all his other rubric marines that hadn't been blown up by Magnus um basically within six inches of this vortex beast so the vortex beast then exploded killed the rest of the cultist and put him down to about 12 13 models on the table um and yeah he just struck my hand and he said yeah that that's game he said i'll draw cards and you know see what i can score but yeah you, you're basically going to table me in the next turn or two um so wow. yeah we shook hands and that game was over I think an hour and 15 minutes into uh round three on day one <laughs> wow so it sounds like you got a bit a bit lucky with that one then it sounds like Definitely. um sounds like because you're up against the ropes until I mean, obviously it sounds like you also still had some play that you know you could have sort of uh squeaked out you know without those sort of you know weird dice instances happening on you know with kind of magnets and stuff but that's 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 a pretty impressive win that one so yeah, yeah. nice work on that so so obviously at this point you know you're undefeated on on day one and I guess you you go into bed and you've you know you've you've got a bit of time, don't you? Know what your pairing is before the the next day. What, what what did you get paired into? What did you what did you have lined up at that point? So day two, round one was into Eldar, um, and I had a quick look at the guy that I was playing. And he, I think he was ranked thirty five in the UK. Um, so I was like, I'm going to be up against it. Um, he had a night spinner, um, your typical utility units for Eldar, and he had the double uh, avatar list. So oh, I was like, okay. this is going to potentially hurt quite a bit. Um, so I was having a quick chat to 
the people that were staying in the hotel with trying to find out you know, what his list does because I haven't actually played Eldar with Death Guard um, this edition. Mm. So yeah, we had, had a bit of a chat, came up with a bit of a game plan um, and then went into the game and the, it sort of went how I expected apart from um, he was a bit cautious because um, obviously he puts a unit out that dies to teleport the Incarn. Um, which I was expecting, so I'd lined other stuff up to make sure that he couldn't move without taking a load of Overwatch. Um, and yeah, basically he'd, he'd moved on to one objective, um, used the Night Spinner to pin a unit of cultists in place, um, and then I mortared off, I think it was a unit of Warp Spiders, he teleported the Avatar over, um, did what he did, and then I, th I think I took three or four wounds off it um, just with incidental shooting um, and then he moved it in front of a unit of Death's Road with the Lord of Virulence. Okay. so I was like okay I'm going to overwatch um, and in this matchup I'd taken minus one save because um, I knew that the to hit wouldn't make that much of a difference because most of his damage is going to be from outside of contagion range um, yeah. I knew I wanted to be doing the charging and getting the hits in so he'd moved into Contagion range, so he'd put the Avatar on a 3-up save. Um, so yeah, I shot that, did I think it was 3 wounds, um, or 4 wounds, whatever it was, uh, put him down to 5 wounds. So he then charged in. Um, I don't think he actually killed... He might, might have killed 1 Death Road or 2 Death Road. Um, oh, that's pretty lucky. But, yeah. So I was quite happy at that point. Um, and I'd got my cultists in I think I might have charged the cultists in um, but basically just taken a couple more wounds off and then eventually just threw a grenade um, and took the last couple of the wounds grenade strat, you mean. Yeah. so took the last couple of wounds off with that um, so that was dealt with after turn three um, his other avatar was hiding because again the land raider just plonked itself in midfield and just sat near Mortarion and went okay come near me you don't half your damage so he really didn't want to come out because one shot from a land raider fails a couple of saves and uh, you know he's, he's taking the full brunt of the damage and he only has 14 wounds to play with um, yeah, he I takes guess plus I mean one on the land raider statistically the land raider probably still doesn't kill him with the four pin bum but I guess no. so but he's, when he's backed up with Mortarion then threatening a charge afterwards, um, it's it's a sort of one-two punch that, you know, he can't just sort of throw an avatar away, um, especially seeing as though it's one of the only things that he had left. So round four, he did decide to commit the avatar, um, came out, killed the Plague Bus Crawler, um, his Wraith Guard killed my um, Land Raider, and then... He'd gone tactical and he'd pulled um, kill something on an objective and early denial, I think it was, um, and Mortarium was stood on an objective in the middle. So it ended up being basically he charged Mortarion um, and took him from full health down to one wound. So I was like, I, I'd literally failed all my saves and then when I hit back, he passed all of his. Um, so I was like, well, that's not gone in my favour. Um, mm -hmm. so I had bottom of turn um, and I was looking at it and I'm like I'm actually only a couple of points behind here um, so I, I can still definitely win this so another unit of cultists went two turns earlier walking towards his home field objective um, there was a night spinner on that was OC3 um, and I had seven cultists and in his turn he popped out shot the cultists um and took them down to two models. If he'd have taken them down to three, then I'd have contested his home field. Um, and that would have meant that it would have been a dead draw because he, he ended up winning by five points, uh, which was, I think it was a 93-98 in the end. Um, that's, that's still so, pretty good, though. I mean, it sounds yeah. like... Because, I mean, the reality is with Eldar versus Death Guard, especially if the guy's a skilled player you are always up against it in that matchup yeah. you've got to have some lucky dice or really outplay them to 
to sort of win. So the fact that you're able to sort of drag it close and you know run him run him through the gauntlet, it sounds like you you know you, you played your skin off there. Because yeah. did the guy because Aidan had said on our on a previous podcast just for the listeners linking back to the live stream that um, we did on YouTube. So if anyone wants to go back and sort of deep dive Aidan's games, he did mention because obviously you you finished top death guard player, didn't you of the yeah. of the event. He said that you um, did that because of strength of schedule. So obviously- yeah, so the way that LGT was working this year was um, overall placings were strength of schedule based rather than um, points based. I think I ended up scoring higher than all the other Death Guard players anyway, because I'd had um, like my only loss was a 93 point loss. Um, my other four games were 88, 98, 98 and 99. Um, so I, I did end up scoring quite high anyway. So I think I ended up a couple of points above Aiden if we would have gone off uh, battle points anyway. But yeah, for this large event, they were doing strength schedule, uh, which is one that I've never done before. So I was uh, a bit worried that sort of the people that I'd beat potentially would have made um, my place in a lot lower if they hadn't have done well themselves. Okay, so because the reason I'm saying because the Eldar player, I assume it's the Eldar player that you mentioned. He what did he go five and zero in the end? Is that is I that right? I believe so. Yeah, um, I was checking his purrings and um, at some point he'd got a zero zero, but I don't know if that was uh, round five or round six. And I don't know if that was because um, that was quite hard on. Um, sort of scores being in at the right times after uh, a previous year's mess around. Um, so anyone that hadn't submitted the scores, I think it was about five minutes after the end of the round, um, he gave a verbal warning of like 30 seconds to a minute and then anyone that still hadn't submitted, uh, he just zeroed um, my zero zero draw. Ah, uh, right, okay. So maybe that's happened. I mean, I suppose... If it was the shadow round in round six, perhaps of course as well. Maybe it's him and the, the person he was paired to play yeah. decided they weren't gonna weren't gonna continue and sort of called it there at five, which would I, I presume Zach would have also zero zeroed if he'd already done the pair. Yeah, but, probably. Yeah, I, I don't admittedly I wasn't there and uh, and things, but sounds good. But obviously, you know, we've still got one more game to go. And you know, obviously, it's it's three three one at this point. So you know, even a three two, I'm guessing you'd have been you'd have been relatively happy with. But you know, obviously. Four ones always better, and as we know, you uh, you know, <laughs> as we spoke at the start, you, you did achieve it. So, so what did you, what did you, what did you go and do in round five? And you know, what sort of, um, what did you, what did you face, and uh, how did you feel at the start of the game? Yeah, so going into it, I was um, like going to LGT. I was saying to my partner that I wanted to go three two, um, and with a list that I've not really got much practice with. Um, Because I hadn't actually played any games at all with the list with the Land Raider in. um, And I'd only played in a GT with the previous list and two practice games. So I hadn't actually got much in the way of actual games in before going into LGT. So 3-2 I would have been relatively happy with. Uh, And then I looked at the Purrins and it was another Eldar player. Um, (laughs) It was, it was, um, this time it was Double Fire Prism, um, Fugan. Shadow Spectres. Um, spiders and Hawks, I think it was. Um, okay. And then so, your typical so still obviously, guard brick. Um, I was going to say, so it's still Eldar, but it's not quite... It's not quite as meta as the most meta of meta Eldar lists, but yeah, it's still, it was, still got all the you, tools in it. You still had your uh, Way Leaper, you still had your two Farseers, uh, one on foot and one on a bike with um, the Phoenix Gem on the foot one. Um, you still had your 10 Wraith Guard with a Spirit Seer with them. Um, and I'll be honest, over the two games, I didn't even kill a single Wraith Guard because I just went, cool, I'm not going to do enough damage to them for it to matter and they'll grow one back so there's no point in even shooting them so I just got rid of um, most of the scoring uh, and this guy had a war walker as well um, so just, just, remember, go on. just for the listeners at home then obviously so what would you class as the scoring in the Eldar list because obviously that's something that, that people will want to know you know what what, what are the units so it's all the of... five man units that have got stupid mobility of uh like 24 inches uh, from the warp spiders or 14 inches on the other stuff can deep strike and then shoot and move 
you know, all that sort of stuff. So, so it was the um, hawks and the warp spiders that you were sort of targeting first and foremost. Yeah, mainly. Um, Open hawk. Sorry for people listening at home. Yeah, um, the war walker has a nine inch scope move as well. I think it's a nine inch scope move, um, and I know that, that that thing can be quite tough to kill. Um, they've got surprising, you know, like they've got good guns as well, haven't they? Was he, I assume he had the bright lances on. Them. Yeah, he did have the bright lances, which obviously can make a mess of any one of my vehicles um, yeah, with, with the free re-roll, re-roll, re-roll well, to hit and wound yeah so I got first turn in that game um, I managed to I think I killed his farce here with the phoenix gem but obviously he rolls to get back up on that one um, and then I killed his war walker turn one um, which he was impressed with to say the least um, so I think I got nine hits on the plague bus crawler that was shooting out of line of sight and obviously he can't do his minus one to wound because um, I was in range of Mortarion um, and yeah nice. just sort of four saves on him and he failed enough saves to uh, sort of lose that because uh, I think I was wounding it on threes without the minus one Um so nice. yeah, just managed to kill that, which I was surprised about. Um, put his Farseer down, and then his next turn he brought a couple of his scoring units in. Um, and again, the Maltus just sort of picked one, made sure it was dead, picked on a second one. If that died, you know, great. If not, I'd sort of go and deal with it with something else or shoot it again next turn. Because uh, they are surprisingly resilient, even though they're only toughness three and you're re-rolling ones to wound. Because um, they've got like three, four up saves um, sat behind yeah. the wall, you've got cover. So I couldn't really get line of sight on them to ignore cover, but I was just blasting away at them and uh, hoping that he failed saves. And again, by turn, I think it was turn two, um, he looked to me, he was like, I cannot win this game. There is no possible way that I can win this game. Um, he said... Oh, on turn two already, wow. Turn two, yeah. Um, j- just because I'd done that much damage to his scoring units, he, he could kill things, uh, but he just couldn't push up past the midboard and score. Um, so did then- you... And at this point then, because you're talking, it's a, had you taken fixed yourself, had you? Or are you, yeah, you still I think fixed doing the, the entire tournament. Um, didn't go, do tactical any times. Um, and what and, was your second one in this one then? Was it was it assassinate again or did you, um, did you take cleanse? Or? I think it was assassinate again. Uh, again, because he had um, three or four characters that were without units just sat on their own. Um, and it meant that he couldn't get aggressive with the character placement. Um, so otherwise, you, he was just giving me points. So do you just literally shoot the mortars at the characters then, uh, and the scoring units? Is that is that literally the, yeah, the gameplay? Just, just got myself points by shooting the characters um, and denied him points by getting rid of his fastest units. Because uh, that's when, really good. When at the end he ends up with basically two fire prisms sat in his home field um, they're not fast enough to get out and they're not that survivable um, he still had his wraith guard but I find people don't tend to get too aggressive with wraith guard when there's an entire death guard army sort of stirring them down um, I mean if he'd have say, just say hypothetically if he had have just gone stuff it and I'm going to just advance or charge the wraith guard on the middle <laughs> kill the nurglings and I'm just going to stand on the middle with the wraith guard because they are still durable do you think that would have been a smart play for or do you think at that point you had enough stuff that with Morty sort of mean they can't affect the damage Basically, you, just, you just cleared them off I had the death shroud lined up um, that if he did commit the uh, wraith guard because um, they're classed as infantry so the anti-infantry works off the death, uh, death shroud pistols Oh, the four. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I had that lined up to potentially get them in contagion range. Because again, I've got minus one to save against them. Um, if you get in contagion range and then you use the minus one AP as well, um, you're putting them to a four up save. You're hitting them. Uh, you also hitting wounding on fours. Um, and with Lord of Virulence, you've got the full uh, wound rerolls um, and another set of dice to put in there. Uh, minus one AP standard so they'd be minus three putting them on fives um, and their anti-infantry two up so nice. yeah that basically set it up so that if he did commit them um, I could do a serious amount of damage probably not kill them in one turn but do enough damage that they wouldn't be doing anything in return that's really good so 
Um, so obviously that's a, obviously another another win for you then. So, so in summary, then it sounds like you know the fixed secondaries work really well with the list. And I mean, did you? So what did the Rhino and the the two foul blight spawn? Because I know you mentioned in the first game rapid ingress in, but you know since then we haven't really talked about the other ones. Did you did you find that was useful in all games, or did it sort of just lurk and sort of you know was it poised to sort of like count the strike things? Because that that's I think one of the more interesting units in the list for sure yeah so it tended to basically just skirt around the flank um so if people commit enough to deal with that then the committing to a flank where i've only committed you know like 250 points whatever it is it's probably not even that i think it's about 180 points is that 175, 175 for the rhino? 175, um, yeah. Yeah. 50, 50 each for the bike spawns, yeah. So, and obviously if they come within 12 of it, um, and I can shoot them, then I'm getting my shots with 2d6 auto-hitting anti-infantry to up flamers. Um, nice. But two damage. So, yeah, it, nice. it's basically just sort of either screened off areas or um, pushed up, but in that last game, um, he wouldn't let me deep strike anywhere, so I used the Rhino to, um, I think, move and advanced because there was nothing I was going to be able to shoot, and then move and advanced again. Um, no, sorry, I didn't advance the second time. I uh, just moved uh, to get the Rhino towing into his home field so that that could do deploy teleport homers, and then the two guys oh, got nice. out. Um, so when the two guys get out, they can then still fire because uh, they're not doing the action. So, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Literally just murdered uh, some of his stuff on his home field, and again, it's then you've got three units sat in the backfield um, rather than just one. So he's got three different activations that he needs to do to realistically kill them. Yeah, that's um, really good. That, and then I suppose at that point, the charging—you don't really want to charge a foul blight spawn with that flamer. Can no. I just just check something? I mean, maybe you'll you'll clarify because you didn't ever overwatch with the rhino and the blight spawn, did you? Because I no, was I was the <laughs> yeah, I was in the impression you could until yeah, someone so, corrected me in the comments under the video. So I just wanted to sort of see either if you had a, another another angle on that where you thought you could. But yeah, no, so it sounds uh, like yeah, the, these fire points correctly. can only be used in the shooting phase. Um, so I, I was aware of that going in, um, and I did make my opponents aware of that because a couple of them did think that I could overwatch if they moved. I said, no, I can't overwatch. It is only in the shooting phase that you can use um, the fire points. Yeah, I mean it's it's a really it's a really smart player that though with the Rhino to be honest I I, I really like that uh, I think that's something that I think definitely something I might try and adopt in a couple of my lists. Um, yeah. So talking about the list itself then because obviously you've you've played a few different games were there any changes that you think you would consider because I mean we mentioned there uh, about the UKTC the way there. The way they're set up, you've always got kind of like a ruin facing your own deployment zone that isn't on the centre objective, so you can always get the Nurglings within six. But you know, on other terrain types where the centre is a bit more open, do you, would you still would you still go for the same list, the same tactic, or do you think you keep the same list and just run cards? Um, you know, uh, sorry, tactical. Sorry, what, what are there anything that you sort of take into consideration there? Yeah, I mean, the list can still do tactical, um, but if you're basing the list around tactical i think you drop the tally man um because literally all it does is sit there and get your cp which if you go in tactical any of them that require you being in your opponent's deployment zone you're probably just discarding them because uh, you can do kill secondaries and most of the others require you being either in corners um or the center of the board which i think you can still quite easily easily do i just don't think you get in um sort of the high 90s which is what i got in most of my games so i think if you were to try and do tactical you'd need to change the list a little bit but i've been looking at um the list and there's a lot of stuff that i look at and i'm thinking it didn't do too well in this game should i drop it but then i look at another game and i'm like well actually that probably won me the game though um like mortari and some games all he was doing is ignoring the minus one to hit on the plague bus crawlers which 325 points just to ignore a minus one to hit there's, there's yeah, other way to do it in it. the death guard list um but then in some matchups like the one against magnus um 
if he wasn't there, he'd have blanked two of them D6 damages, and then I wouldn't have killed him, and then everything would have probably swung in the thousand sun favour. Yeah, no, that's very fair. I mean, more tiring to weird model in that sense, isn't he? Like, he's, he's, he's buffing... It's a good utility piece, I suppose, in every game he's, he's kind of useful, because there are some games where maybe you can just throw him away and just, you know, rush him towards a mid bone either. You have to you have to shoot him over the things, or he gets him does damage, because his damage output isn't great, but it's also good enough that, you know, you have to sort of, you have to respect him. So he's... Yeah, so that's, that's interesting. Yeah. Isn't? I mean, so one of the things that um, a lot of people don't remember about Mortarion is he does have the grenade keyword. Um, so you can actually stuff him up into the centre of the board, uh, do an action with him, uh, not fire his guns. And then if there's anything within eight, just spend the CP to use the grenade strat with him. Nice. Can you, I'm, I'm never sure of the grenade strat. Is it, can you fire his guns and throw the grenade strat as well? So or is, you it, can. is it one or the other? Um, the an interesting thing that I found out in one of my practice games um, was that throwing a grenade doesn't stop you shooting. It also doesn't stop you doing an action because you don't actually have to be eligible to shoot to throw a grenade. You just have to be not in engagement range and shoot uh, and aiming at an eligible target. Um, so one of the things that I was doing in my previous list was I had the. Um, Icon Bearer in the Rhino with the Foe Blight Spawn and he tended to get somewhere where I needed to do an action. He'd jump out, he'd plant his banner because that doesn't stop him shooting or anything. Um, he'd do an action because again that just requires you to be eligible to shoot and then he'd throw a grenade on top of it because um, oh, none of them would stop you doing any of the others. Um, so it was quite interesting. So oh, okay, I hadn't thought I hadn't thought about throwing grenades in the banner guy because yeah, he's a plague moon, any so he's got the grenade yeah. keyword. That's quite smart. So, because one of the questions I had, so so listening to you talk and having sort of looked a little bit at the list before before we did this, the things that to me don't maybe maybe could could like, don't they're not essential to the list in my opinion, and I was curious to sort of you know you you might say otherwise. How did you find the Tallyman and the Banner Bearer? I mean, was the Banner Bearer like... I understand the once per game, he plants his banner, you get the 12-inch Contagion. Was that meaningful? Did it come in and did it sort of like change the game at any point? Or did you find that it was just another character just running around doing doing actions for you? you know, well, what were for, you? for LGT, I actually did drop the Banner Man to fit the Land Raider in. Um, oh, sorry, yeah. right, yeah. So, yeah, I don't think it's needed. Um... There's, I think there's lists where you do put him in and you put him in a unit of Plague Marines um, and you sit them somewhere near mid-board um, and you just have, like, what, 32 RC just with a unit of 10 and him in the unit. Uh, stick another character in there and you're looking at probably 34 RC somewhere because um, at that point, most people aren't taking objectives off you. They have to kill you off the objective. Um so I have been looking at lists that run um, more Plague Marines, and I think he fits in that list. Because um, if I remember correctly, though I'm not 100% sure, um, I think he gives the unit a 12-inch aura uh, when he plants his banner. It could just be his model. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but, I'm not 100% sure myself. I mean, I could... Uh, yeah, I'm uh, trying to be quiet the thing. I, I can try and find his data card, and we can answer that on the podcast the people yeah. might be uh, in the, try, trying to have their uh, background noise because <laughs> my <laughs> mic was always traditionally very bad with this uh, but I've got it here yeah. so once per battle at the end of your movement phase this model can use his ability if he does until the start of your next man phase this model's unit so it is the unit is treats having a 12 inch contagion range so you are right actually yeah. so if you attach him to a unit which I hadn't actually uh, thought of myself you could probably be quite clever with the uh the place in the model, especially in a 10 man. I mean, you might be throwing them away to some extent, but you could, you know, spread them out and get a, a massive, massive contest. So that, that's, that's another clever, clever thing I hadn't really thought of there. Yeah, so the other thing that you can do is, um, using Mortarion's other aura that people don't use to extend the contagion range by three of units that are within, uh, 12 inches of him. So you can have Mortarion 12 inches away from a plague marine, plant the banner and you've got a 15 inch um, from every model in that unit uh, nice. where you can stage and ranges and the other thing that I was playing with um, which is only really good in like Eldar matchups but also sort of works into Wraith Guard um, 
is giving him living plague as well because I haven't found anything yet that says that you can't extend the range multiple times. So with Living Plague and Mortarians extending, um, when the banner guy plants his banner, he has an 18-inch range um, aura for his things. So anything that's got an 18-inch range on the guns, like the Tau Cyclic Ions and stuff like that, have to be in Contagion range to um, shoot you, which puts Tau back to the normal ballistic skill and then you spend a cp to make them hit on like fives or sixes no oh, nice okay so some quite quite smart players there then and the other one i wanted to ask about was the tally man now i look at the tally man sometimes and i think he looks really good but then i forget you can only roll now in your command phase rather than yeah. yours and the opponents which was you know the last edition and I find that when I look at him, I think, well, if you're adding the Plague Marines, a plus one hits meaningful, but obviously then you're fighting for that sort of Vivians and blah, blah, blah. Like, is it better to put him with Plague Marines or are you just sort of like better with more Plague Marines? How did you find him? Did you find him to be worth his 45 points or was he something that you thought he could be there? Or Because, for example, in, in your list, maybe would a third Foul Blight Spawn have been better at times or did, you, did that CP really come in handy? I think the two Foul Blight Spawn are probably the better choice. Now, my list is exactly 2,000 points, uh, and I think the Tallyman's 45 compared to 50, so I'd have to drop five points somewhere. Uh, but again, I don't think that would necessarily work because you don't have the third fire point on the Rhino, so I think two is the sweet spot for the um, Foul Blight Spawns, unless the leading units. Um, but yeah, the not- Tallyman. Could you not maybe be a third unit in Nurglings, for example? Because you said you'd like the third unit. Or like I said, it's basically just how valuable is the CP, is this the curiosity I've got? Because I'm, Yeah, it's I, it's not just the CP, it's in matchups where things can't deep strike particularly well. Um so Grey Knights and Grey Knights Eldar and Chaos Demons, um, are a pain in the ass because they've got the coming within three inches. Now you can stick your home field objective, but screening it out in matchups where you want to push forward with the um, plague bursts is a massive pain. Um, so having the tally man with his 40 mil base literally sit on the objective um, means that they have to do something extra to be able to take your home field off you. Oh, okay, because yeah, cause I suppose yeah, you're right, because it's exactly the same size as the objective. So yep. three inches, you got to be through. You can't, you can't stand on it. So that's that's a good use for him actually, because there's been a couple of times I've had the odd, the awkward forty-five point spare, and I've been wondering what to do. So yep. so he's there for that. And then if someone did have indirect fire, like you say, because he, he didn't play against guard. I know they had the night spinners, but it's only twenty-four inch out out of line of sight, isn't it? So if someone could have threaten the characters and sort of so they're going to you know exploit your the fact that you give away assassinate would you have just stuck him in the rhino and then just took the rhino in the back corner or something or? Um, I think I actually did in one matchup stick him in the rhino um, because my opponent had taken assassinate um, and it might have been the grey knight matchup um, but yeah I, I did exactly that I, I basically played the rhino as a defensive box for the characters um, when people took assassinate. Now, you're not going to get his CP from it, but um, I think I ended up dropping him off behind the wall on an objective, and he literally just sat on an objective that was over to one side um, that, you know, he was relatively safe for a turn or two. Yeah, Um, so later in the game when you could kind of see where things were where, where things could and couldn't go you felt a bit safer sort of popping him out yeah and it's it's also about trading points um so what you don't want to do is throw three characters away and give away what 12 points on assassinate um unless you're scoring 15 16 points in return so if he goes and sits on an objective um and let's say he scores you five points extra for sitting on that objective um and then he stickies it and he forces something to come out of uh, position to deal with him um, it then allows you to trade up because you're going to score you five points on primary, which they're only scoring four for secondaries. So you're already a point up on that trade. Um, obviously, if you're already scoring the maximum on primary, then don't bother because you're not getting anything out of it. But then you're also pulling normally a more expensive unit out of position to come and deal with him, which then allows you to sort of kill something in return so you've traded up in 
victory points and physical points on the table. No, it's really smart. Like I said, it, it all makes it all makes really good sense. Um, and then the other thing that I was I wanted to sort of ask, and this was a curiosity if you thought about trying to fit it in, but I think from, from the way you described it, it sounded like your list is already sort of what you dropped to put it in. Because I did come with the land raider that you obviously can put typhus and three death shroud or lord of villains and three death shroud you've got one other spot um would be um the lord of contagion because obviously 80 points is a bit of a beat stick and he's got the two attacking profiles i know some people don't rate him massively because he's he's not as good as the other characters admittedly but at 80 points you know and he, he takes that last slot you know it's another thing that can maybe jump out the the land raider and just go and you know he could quite reliably sort of take down the last few cultists or something on an objective if you've already sort of put a mortar in them or something like that was was that ever a consideration or was it just no way no way you could make the points work yeah i did look at it but um a lot of the list is sort of trying to get the synergies that um the death guard now have so the reason that i went with typhus over um a lot of contagion or anything like that was purely and simply because of the minus one to hit in combat so again oh into the orc matchup the reason that typhus lasted so long um was because i'd gone for the minus one weapon skill ballistic skill then there was the minus one to hit from typhus uh, himself being in the death shroud and then there's a minus one to wound on top of it for the death shroud having a character attached oh yeah of course i mean i i, I think in your list i think any list that, that can take typhus unless you're going down a particular skew or you really just don't want characters I think Typhus is, is always the extra 20 points is way worth it. It was more just to see if you could put him in as well somewhere so you could have Typhus, three Death Shroud, and then him as your fifth your fifth model in it, for example. But And like I say, from what we've discussed, it sounds like maybe the Tallyman could be 45 points, but then you're still, you're still 35 points short, and it sounds like the Nurglings, which could be the other thing you'd drop, would be too valuable for that... Um, the fixed, fixed seconds yeah, you've been playing? Yeah, definitely, definitely not go below two units of Nurglings. Uh, one to sit in the centre and one to threaten deep strike. Sometimes it was the only thing I was putting in deep strike, but because my opponent knows that over the game, it's a good chunk of points. Uh, it's four points a turn if the Nurglings get into your deployment zone as opposed to three in the centre. Um, so them extra four points literally can win your games. Um, yeah, it makes good sense. So, but yeah, the, the the one thing like every game I sat there and I thought, was this worth it? Was it not? And the foul blight spawn in the Rhino were ones that um, I was a bit sort of cautious about. But in the previous lists um, before LGT, when I've taken them, um, they have been absolutely phenomenal. Um, I ended up playing in the Invitational, not with the same list. Uh, it was with the list with the Hellbrute and uh, the extra unit of Nurglings in. Um, and I played into um, Chaos Demons. Mm. And yeah, I, I was talking to someone afterwards who was a mate of the guy that I played. And um, apparently... He was looking at my list going, like, what the hell is this stupid idiot doing putting two characters in a rhino? Like, what the <laughs> hell does that do? Um, and then he had a 10-man unit of um, flesh hounds, which are two wounds apiece, um, and they're on light softness four. So I've got them in contagion range, um, was wounding them on twos and doing two damage apiece from the thing. <laughs> Obviously, the AP didn't matter, but... Yeah, I was doing like 2d6 damage um, out of the thing. And yeah, he was like, all right, I've just lost half a unit of hounds on like a relatively sort of average roll from these 2d6 flamers. That's pretty smart, that. I mean, yeah, because it sounds to me uh, like they're... So I, I've been on a list of... I won't run through my list on this podcast. This has nothing to do with, with me and my games. That's a whole other thing. But I found Flesh Mower Drones might have the same issue as the foul blight spawns in the sense of in certain profiles like say marine bodies for example flesh hounds are another good example you know say there's like five six wounds in the unit or five six bodies two two wounds each they're great into those things but into like say a vehicle they're not strong enough to get through the armor and then into like say 10 10 cultists uh, or 10 guardsmen they're not reliable enough on the number of shots or the amount of damage that you get through, say, a flesh more 10 attacks. 
it's on three, so it's maybe you know six, six or seven. Then you likely roll one or two ones on the on the damage, and then you know you find you put say five, five, six damage through on ten cultists, four cultists are left. You've only got two OC, and they still hold the point. But obviously, five Space Marines, you know, they that it's a perfect target. So I don't know, maybe they've got that sort of. They need to be in the list for those instances where you have those mid range, you know, power armor bodies. But when they're not there. They feel a bit redundant. I don't know. Was that maybe a similar sort of instance yeah, with, with um, that? There's was, there was actually, interestingly, a couple of times where I fired them into um, Terminators. Um, again, not in the LGT games, but in some of the games the week before at the GT. Um, Drago deep struck, killed my uh, Rhino. The guys popped out, and then in my turn, I took four of his bodyguard out with um, the flamers, just from getting sort of quite decent rolls um, in being in contagion range for the minus one. And then, you know, just hitting him with two damage. Um, so yeah, that that was sort of quite good going. But then in other matchups, they literally just drive around. Um, but the other thing I've found is they are quite good utility pieces if you need to drop one off behind a wall um on an objective then they're not actually that ha like easy to deal with because if someone goes within 12 to try and charge them you can always overwatch so if like let's say marines come up to try and charge you um stay an inch back from the wall so you're still on the objective but making that charge a little bit harder um and then if they try and get in a shorter charge then you normally get to overwatch them. Um, oh yeah, because you have to come with some way you can yeah. see them to... That's smart. Yeah. So, oh. they, they have been quite interesting. Um, not necessarily always worth the points. There's definitely other things you can put in the list that might do better or, or the list that they might do better in. But, um, yeah, th this, if people know what they do and you explain it to them before the game, some people are too scared of them. Um, and then, you know, you end up rolling one shot and they don't do anything, but they've reacted to the fact that it could be, you know, six shots from one of them at strength seven um, and anti-infantry two plus and two damage, um, you know, various AP, depending on what strats and contagions you're willing to put into it. No, that um, sounds really good. And then some people underestimate it and, you know, lose half the unit. No, that makes sense. I mean, <clears throat> it sounds like what you said, where they're maybe not essential for every game, but where they are, they're really good. And then even if they're not essential in terms of their damage output, it sounds like, like you said, they've got a lot of utility for sort of helping you play the mission and, you know, have multiple units to sort of screen out the board and things like that. So it sounds, it sounds like, you know, it sounds like everything in the list has, has got its its place and, and is, uh, is well, is well, well, I mean, the fact that you, you went 4-1 and even the game you lost, it sounds like you, you ran a, a really good player with a really good list close, which is which is more props to you. So, I mean, obviously, we're, we're probably coming to the point where it's, you know, uh, it's probably a good time to sort of wrap. So I know it's the afternoon, or you said you've got you've got work to go to and uh, things like that. Plus, um, at the end of the episode, we meant to start, I'm going to have to uh, tag team Aiden in and Aiden's going to uh, gonna jump in with a gentleman called Pierce, who also went 4-1 at LGT and have a similar talk with him and run through his list and, and his experience but but before we, we do sort of wrap things up here Sam is there anything you want to sort of add about the list or anything else or also I mean obviously we, we'd, we'd spoke before this because you you know you, you're a local player you come to Stoneham events that we run and see the, uh, the, the WAR events I think we've even played on, on a team event at the same time before you know what what else you've got coming up you know is there anything you want to sort of plug or, or, or talk about you know in terms of any of those things yeah so uh, with regards to the list um, I think Again, this speaks to sort of uh, the build flexibility in Death Guard because I've got three ideas for lists. Uh, one, the list that I'm running at the moment. Uh, one, a bit more flexible, um, but a lot faster. Uh, basically oh. aiming at demon engines and transports to get things in place. Um, then I've got another list that's quite focused on um, sort of plague marines and terminators in transport so nice. death guard are definitely in a, a decent place for list flexibility um so yeah just looking forward to trying them out trying to uh, get a couple more um wins in over the coming months to close off the itc season nice so you're gonna actually sort of stick with death guard then Ian, until the end of the season this you're not going to go because i know you obviously you've done pretty well with the chaos knights list uh and some other factions. I know you as a as a chaos player, 
uh, since myself and, and obviously I mean Aiden's just death guard I'm, I'm just death guard really but outside of tournaments I do play like Chaos Knights and some other stuff um, but do you do you think you're going to stick with death guard for this season or you know or at least until maybe the CSM book comes out or you know where, where are you sort of, what's your stance on, on staying loyal to the faction yeah so as, as you say I'm, I'm mainly a Chaos player I do have other armies um, but I tend to use them to learn different play styles um, which has probably given me the flexibility in the Death Guard builds to sort of think outside the box. Whereas obviously most de- most Death Guard players think, "Oh well, we can't do this, we can't do that." I've played other armies and I'm taking little bits of inspiration from you know playing a Chaos Space Marine list, playing a Chaos Knight list that uses sort of quite a lot of screening and then you know not really going past the mid board and stuff like that and I've just sort of piled it all in one but yeah I'm going to try and close out the season see sort of very well I can do with uh, Death Guard and maybe even put them into one of the I'm trying to limit myself to no more than three armies a season Um, because normally I'll just bounce around and I'll I'll do one GT and I'll be like right next army Um, so yeah I I think I'm going to put Death Guard into the pool of three that I use for the next ITC season Oh, fantastic. Well, we go. That's, uh, that's what we want to hear more, pick, picking up Death Guard as a faction. And, uh, I mean, before we go then, I mean, you mentioned the two of the list ideas you've got. Do you want to expand on them at all? Or, I mean, we can obviously sort of get you back another time and, uh, you know, and sort of, or, you know, give you a chance to sort of play them a bit. Is there anything that you, any tech, anything you wanted to share with people, any sort of recommendations, anything like that? Yeah, so it's just concepts at the moment. But um, I've been looking at basically um, a list that doesn't take anything that starts on the board that's less than Toughness 9. Um, so all the demon engines, rhinos, land raiders, stuff like that. Um, and just basically trying to stat check the opponent a little bit and then hopefully grind them out. Um, and, you know, putting stuff in rhinos and doing the sort of like Russian doll thing where, you know, you've killed the rhino, now two things get out. Um, yeah. So that was one list idea. Just, you know, them things tend to have quite high movement as well, uh, like the bloat drones and... Um, that tend to have like a 10 inch move so when most of your army's got a 10 inch move it can be pretty much on the center line turn one which tends to put a lot of people off um maybe makes them make some mistakes um and then yeah i've got another list that i was looking at again i've not finalized anything i'm just sort of playing around in the app at the moment um the other list is basically a land raider full of um close combat plague marines a rhino full of a 10-man unit of close combat plague marines with uh, support and then a couple of rhinos with five mans and then a couple of plague buds crawlers and then just sort of other utility things uh, like pox walkers cultists and uh, nerglings just to score the points nice okay yeah so hopefully we'll be able to get you uh, get you back on and hopefully have some success with the lists and we can sort of uh, get you back on to, to hear more about them certainly sounds like some some interesting concepts to uh to run through there um yes yeah, so, like i say i mean thanks very much for coming on sam i mean it's, it's been a really interesting talk and i think the list that you ran compared to everyone else that did well at um london uh london grand tournament certainly has a a lot of individuality to it and i think the fact that you sort of went so well with the fixed uh fixed fixed secondaries you know makes uh you know definitely makes for some food for thought and it's got me thinking about some of the list ideas things i hadn't really considered so, so that's really good and like I say, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll tag Team Aiden in now, uh, who's going to uh, talk to, to Pius uh, and sort of, you know, have his perspective on, on the event. Um, but thank you very much again for coming on there, Sam. I see we really, really appreciate that. And like I say, the list is fantastic and so is the result. And, you know, uh, we just look forward to getting on soon. And um, are, you, are you doing the Lords of War event um, in December? Because I know that's your sort of local team, isn't it? Yeah, so uh, that's the team that I play under. Um yeah, I, I won't be making the December event, unfortunately, but um, the first three events of next year I should be at. Uh, December's a bit of an awkward time just because of my missus' work. Um, but yeah, if anyone wants to join us at them events, uh, running two singles events and one teams event next year. Um, so I can go on Lords of our website and all the socials and that and uh, find us on there and we'll be updating as we go along. There you go. That's probably a good, a good chance to plug because obviously this season we ran a, a Rule of the North series uh, with our Stoneham events and the Lords of War guys as well, which finishes on the uh, 
11th and 12th of November at Element Games because uh, obviously the Lord of War run, run great events and I attend a lot as well in the same way you guys attend a lot of hours so if anyone's interested in that in November obviously come down and uh, I shout out the Lord of War guys as well they've got one on the is it 3rd and 4th December that's one that you can't make oh, no, so, yeah. actually I'm pretty sh- I might be the way around actually I think I think it's the 9th and 10th of December it might be the Lord of War one I think the other one is the UKTC uh, that I'm also attending in December um, but anyway but people are interested check those out um, you know if you're in, in the north of England or you want to come to the north of England and sort of uh, you know see what our Met is like uh, then you know two two really good events to check out uh, Lord of War and Stonehammer obviously Stonehammer uh, is a personal one for me that's the one I actually run and TO at but uh, Jason and, and Sam and the other Lord of War guys also fantastic guys and, and run a great event um, but we'll leave that there I say our tag team Aiden so Aiden uh, take it away and Sam thank you very much and uh, yeah um, see you on the next one guys like I say I'll let Aiden, uh, let Aiden do his thing and today we have some special guests on it's going to be a bit of a hodgepodge this one a bit stitched together um, uh, Americans probably just got completely lost in what a hodgepodge means <laughs> but basically um, we've got some guests on today um, it's the other three people that managed to go four and one at the London Grand Tournament which is no means feat uh, no small feat um, so Basically, today I'm going to start off with one, and then we're probably going to stitch in Will, who's interviewed another fella, because unfortunately, trying to interview three different people with all busy you know, lives and whatnot is hard to get at the same time. So it might be a little bit edited together, but hopefully the information's all here. The guys are obviously going to, you know, they're going to be talking about their list, they're going to be talking about how their event went, the games, etc. And we get to know them a little bit, so it's really cool. Like we said, we had four in total, including myself. We went 4-1 at LGT. Sadly, no Death Guard player managed to break the 4-1 like barrier, um, but still going 4-1 with Death Guard at the moment is fantastic, and I think it's a great showing of how improved the faction is. So uh, with me today, I have Pierce. Um, uh, would you want to introduce yourself? Pierce Condren, I believe it is, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Aiden. Um, yeah, my name is Pierce. I'm uh, from Ireland, and I came over to uh, LGT, uh, my first UK TSC event, and I was blown away, firstly, by the, the scale of the event, the, the quality with the food trucks and everything, the terrain, the uh, the booklets as well for the deployment, the excellent, just fantastic things to say about UK TSC all around. Did you steal um, the booklet? I did steal the booklet. Yeah, I was I very book adamant that <laughs> tournaments in Ireland have that from now on because it's like, it was so simple, but it's so brilliant. Yeah, um, it's great to just have. We, we, I just keep my bag now whenever I go and play. I'm like, there we go. All my deployments right there. Yeah, and had the missions and everything in it. Like, there's no question about what's the primary, you know. Um, but yeah, for a first event, a UKTC event was absolutely amazing. Um, I've been playing Warhammer a long time now, but I was so kind of strange that it was my first UKTC event, but uh, playing Warhammer on and off. 17 years i think um i started Ooh. as a blood angel player and then i braced the true chaos of the dark gods and uh, i've not looked back since nice nice so where did you so like let's we say obviously you've been playing for 17 years you just say um then where did you start playing competitively so i started playing competitively i think in about 2010 um i went to a tournament in ireland and met some guys there who um introduced me to a uh, local club me and my, my dad went to tournaments together my, my dad also plays warhammer funnily enough um so we went to this tournament we were introduced to a local club we started playing there and the guys who played there played more competitively so i started getting introduced to that side of the game more and started going to events more frequently i was not very good until they sort of took me under their wing and started kind of mentoring me a little bit and then i started slowly getting better and better and then eventually in 2015 i made it to uh qualify for the country's uh world team championship team and we went over to uh prague to play in the world team championship which is like the world cup of warhammer that's cool man that's really cool so like you said you have been a member of a wtc for for team island i'm going to assume (laughs) yeah yeah of course of course i could apply for team canada if i like i've got canadian citizenship as well but i'm stuck to team ireland since (laughs) (laughs) the roots of home eh (laughs) yeah exactly no that's really cool that because obviously wtc is obviously should give people hopefully if you manage to play for your you know your country hopefully that gives people a sort of an idea of the inkling of how you know skilled you are as a player obviously not everyone can just go and sign up for like team england team ireland team america and whatnot so hopefully people that helps people understand the sort of level of play we're talking about here and hopefully what's one of the main reasons that you went to uh lgt with death guard and managed to pull off a 4-1 because as we both know this isn't an army that kind of just pilots itself 
Um, you can't just rock up with DevCard and go four and one on your first ever event. <laughs> no, absolutely. It's, it, I think it's one of the hardest armies to pilot because you are the slowest in the game and you're not particularly durable. Um, you really have to understand movement very well. You're a slow moving combat army, which is sort of an oxymoron in itself. You want to be a fast moving combat army, like Blood Angels, typically. Um, I Death Guard is my favorite 40k faction. I don't know what it is about them. Maybe maybe we hate ourselves, Aiden. That's why I like to play such a slow moving <laughs> faction. Um, but they are my favorite faction. The models are gorgeous. Um, so whenever they're really strong and viable, I take the opportunity to play them. Like last, uh, in ninth edition, when they got their Nephilim update with Armor of Contempt, all the yes. free war gear, I jumped on them straight away. I was trying to convince my team for the World Cup that year. I was like, look, I think they're good now. My team was like, you've gone crazy, Pierce. Death Guard, not, <laughs> not a chance. And then I started bringing them to singles events with the Ferryman Foul Blight spawn. And then I played against some guys and they were like, oh my God, this is brutal. Um, I don't know if we didn't play in ninth edition remembers, but you didn't count as charging when you were in range of his stench fat relic and you could bump it up to 12 inches with the ferryman. So it was a pretty brutal combination. And uh, I had a lot of fun with that. I brought it to WTC and all I would explain every pregame. I would explain how that works, the relic. And then it would happen in game. My opponent would charge me and they'd go, <laughs> oh my God, this is brutal. I'm like, yep. Yeah, that's exactly what happens. I was trying to tell you, man. I tried to warn you. <laughs> well, you like, so funny story, actually. The last game I played at WTC that year was against uh, Team Iceland. Haydar um, uh, was playing his uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Tyranids. And he had the matchup as favorable to his team's Matrix. Then he charged into me, and then he saw what the Stench Fats did, even though I had told him pregame. And he just went, oh, yeah, I shouldn't be playing you. I'm like, yep, yep. And it went from like <laughs> he had a 20-0, and I just smashed all the Raveners. Mistakes were made. <laughs> Mistakes were made, absolutely. Um, but that's sort of, they're my favorite army, so they become much more, I'm not as nearly devoted as you in terms of playing them for, you know, uh, pre, uh, pre-update, pre where like, I'm playing to pre Eldar and everything. Uh, but when I saw the updates, I was like, they seem kind of fun now. So um, I wanted to give them a shot for LGT. So I kind of settled on a list very similar to what I enjoyed playing in ninth edition. And that's a great segue, actually. Well done. Um, because <laughs> the reason I wanted Piss on especially to talk about it is because he took a very different list to the other list that went uh, four and one, including myself. Um, one that is aptly named the Plot Squad, which I think is a fantastic name. Um, would you like to take us through your list, bud? Yeah. So the Plot Squad came about in uh, in uh, 2022 um, when I came up with it. We, me and one of my teammates devised this Plague Marine list. It was like 45 Plague Marines, and uh, had Dreadclaw drop pod and Rhinos and everything. And we realized how slow it was, but we called it the Plod Squad. As they never got anywhere quickly, they just sort of plodded across the table at you. And uh, the Plod Squad is alive and well uh, in 10th edition. So my list was um, a Biologist Putrefire, a, a second Biologist Putrefire, a Death Guard Chaos Lord with a Plague Encrusted Exalted Weapon, a Plasma Pistol, and the Living Plague Upgrade, which is the upgrade to add three inches to his Contagion range. I had two Foul Blight Spawns. I had Mortarian. I had Typhus. I had four squads of five Plague Marines, and in the five-man Plague Marine squads, I had a champion with a uh, plasma gun and heavy plague weapon. I had a blight launcher. I had another plasma gun, and then I had two heavy plague weapons. So for three heavy plague weapons in total in the squad, and then I had two ten-man Plague Marine squads. So forty Plague Marines in total on this list. The uh, the ten-man Plague Marine squads had a champion with the heavy plague weapon and the uh, plasma gun. I had two blight launchers. Then I had four regular heavy plague weapons. And then I had uh, two extra plasma guns. And then I finally had a, there's a 10th model who I didn't, you can't give him any more heavy plague weapons. So I gave a plague spewer in each squad. Um, then two death guard rhinos, uh, a squad of three death shroud terminators, a plague burst crawler with two plague spitters and the rot hail volley gun, 20 pox walkers, and then three squads of three nurglings. Can't leave home without your nurglings. Uh, you can't. They are our cheerleaders who sit on the sidelines and do wonderful things. Definitely. So this is a very interesting list, especially when I opened it up and was looking at the end of the event. Everyone's sort of like what they've taken. Obviously, you're part of Nurgle's Mansion Discord, so that's kind of where we got talking in there. Um, that's where we sort of found you, and it was quite easy to get you on here, thankfully, because, you know, we share time zones. Yeah. <laughs> it's a miracle. <laughs> um, so... What I'm interested about the list, before we go into sort of your game stuff, I just want to ask a few questions about the list, which I found interesting. So, you've actually not gone, you do have a Plague Burst Crawl, but you've not gone for the Triple Plague Burst Crawler, which is quite, a lot of people are calling it like a staple at the moment. Now, I'm assuming you still kept the one because you wanted something that could hold your backfield and still contribute to the game, am I correct in that? Uh, Absolutely. So, the, I originally started with more Plague Burst Crawlers, um, 
uh, in terms of this, is, it's very much a playstyle thing. Uh, my list sort of um, uh, going too much of tangent. It's a, I play better with infantry models than I yeah. do with tanks. Um, the way I could is it, a tank has like a, if you imagine a rhino, a rhino has a rectangular footprint on the table. You can't really change that. You can alternate the angles it's at. You can hide it behind runes. Whereas an infantry squad, if you imagine 10 models, you can kind of modulate that footprint of that squad and do different things like block movement and take up area denial on the table and whatnot. Yeah. And you could do creative things like casualty removal um, that you can't really do with vehicles. So I started with more. I found I didn't really play well with them. Um, I did want something to hold the backfield, as you say, though. Um, I, part of Team Tryhard is who I represent in singles. So I don't know if you've heard of Tryhard Wargaming. There's a, a, a have, big yeah, TTS yeah. community. Um, and talking with one of my teammates, Max, we kind of came to the conclusion that there's lots of units like Shadow Spectres floating around that will drop yes. on your backfield and they'll kill Plague Marines pretty effectively on the backfield objectives. But a Plague Burst Crawler is something that has four OC. It has flamers. So when stuff like Inceptors deep strikes next to you, you just put a bunch of uh, flamers at strength six, minus one, one damage, anti-infantry two plus into them. Yeah, and it's very hard to take objective off a plague burst crawler compared to taking it off plague marines. And as you say, it can it can chip in with the mortar a little bit as well. Um, so it's just it's a better backfield objective holder I found compared to plague marines. Yeah, I like the use of the plague spit as well. A lot of people would assume, oh, it's a backfield entropy, uh, black, sorry, backfield plague burst crawler. Surely it's going to have entropy to shoot out. But you've made the conscious decision there, being like, okay. These units exist in the game that are going to be able to try and, you know, if they draw, you know, capture enemy stronghold, if five Seraphim drop in and all of them get onto my point, they take it off me. Whereas with, I only need to kill one of them because as you said, it's AOC4. Having the yeah, two exactly. plague is there just really helped shore up that problem and just being like, hey, you want to take this off me? I hope you're prepared for the Overwatch. And it, again, it, like you said, it, it's much tougher to kill as well. This isn't someone that's going to get, you know, mortar teamed off like 10 cultists can. Um, it's not going to get picked up by, like you say, Inceptors or anything like that. So it's, I, I like the idea. I like it. I like it. It's good uh, to still have one. Yeah, and it, like we have sticky objectives as our faction ability still. So like you sticky the objective when their reserve threat is gone, the Plague Burst Crawler, they can roll off by himself. And, you know, the Flamer Overwatch is very potent in general with the uh, yeah. shots. Yeah, that's true. Very true. So my other question I've got is, and I'm sure you've been asked this many times. So we're looking at six squads of Plague Marines. Yeah. Only two rhinos. Why? <laughs> yeah. So I originally had more, but I found rhinos were difficult to hide. Now I yes. do what's called the rhino uber, um, which <laughs> is you start your rhinos and like, the, especially on UKTC, you know, you can get your rhinos jammed right up in the rune. And I start the ten man squads in that with typically the attached characters of the putrefier and the, and then the foul blightspawn or the lord, depending on the matchup, sort of uh, uh, dictates who joins what. A lot of the time, the foul blightspawn went off by themselves, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and what I'll do is on turn one, I will typically uh, move uh, a rhino up. The squad inside will, the 10 man will then get out on an objective. Yeah. And what I'll do is I'll have position two, the two five mans near the rhino so they can advance and then embark in that rhino after it's moved. So I've got a bunch of extra movement out of that then. Uh, but my guys inside then have like, you know, I've effectively moved four, uh, three squads up the table uh, by doing so. That's really cool. I like that. That's, 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 how, that's what I assumed you were doing. And then obviously from that position, you can launch out either five-man squads or your ten-man squad as the mission needs. I'm assuming that's what you're doing. Yes. It, the, the the thing I found was consistently um, folks underestimate it was, you know, before the Rhino moves, your guys can disembark freely and then still move and charge. Folks really underestimated that three-inch disembark plus yeah. the five-inch move for your threat range. And it gave you the, the opportunity for charges that they wouldn't necessarily have thought possible. Um, yeah, like will, change you know like a nine into like a six or a seven. Yeah, I will say because back in uh, ninth edition, I actually used uh, two rhinos with plague marines a lot, sort of with this exact same style of catapulting you know units out of it, having another unit sat nearby to take the place of one that was previously in it. And I will say I've not been using any in tenth. And after and the reason I haven't is because I've been able to practice much, so I've been running the same sort of list. Um, yeah. But I think I'm actually going to join you on the plague marine side because I the point you made before about vehicles not being modular with like how they can position and stuff i figuring out that i'm actually i'm good at target priority it's one of my strengths as a player like on my mortars and doing the maths in my head and knowing what should die my problem is though is moving vehicles is not what i'm good at um, and there'll be often times where i'm like i've cut myself you know at an inch short of what i needed to be or like you know i can't get around that corner and i thought i could and 
because moving infantry is so much simpler like you said when you but compared to like trying to charge like a plague burst crawl around a corner to get a tank shock on or you can just go straight through the wall of some plague marines <laughs> well, well exactly this and, and I, I think I understand 40k is a game with a lot more coverage these days so there's a lot more meta listing going on and whatnot but as someone who's been around a long time playing competitive 40k um, I think there's a lot of room for creativity and f identifying your play style is so important. Um, I think for, it's one of the most underrated aspects of the game. Mm -hmm. Like you can make the best aggressive list ever, but if you give it to a defensive player, it's a waste of time in my view. You know, um, I watch a lot of Formula One. It's like my, my, the sport I enjoy. And I compare it like driving styles to play styles. You know, you can, the guy can have the fastest car in the world, but if it doesn't match his driving style, he won't be able to get the speed out of it if you get me. You know, I totally get you, and it's something I've actually covered in the Faction Fundamentals talking about why we shouldn't get too obsessed with metalists, because it's exactly what you said there. It's, you know, people play, even within the same faction, people don't play factions the same. Like you said, there's defensive players, there's offensive players, there's players that really like skew lists, there's players that really like mass infantry, all sorts of different things. And, like, for example, I talked to Don, you'd be, I'm assuming you know Don Hooson. Yeah, I'm yeah. familiar with him from the uh, Death Guard Discord. He's like yeah. the OG Death Guard. <laughs> yeah, and he, he's a big fan of his Demon Engine spam. I've, I, I took that list, tried to play at a local club, and I got smashed. I can't play that list for my life for me. I don't enjoy it, but he obviously does well with it. But, it, that, but this is the point we're trying to make. Like even like yourself, who you said like you know you're a WTC class player, you don't like and you would probably struggle more playing a heavy vehicle list, even if technically that is the more like you know inverted commas meta list. Uh, absolutely, I am a uh, melee player um, and movement player. That is my forte. Is I'm like obviously melee is much weaker in tenth edition, but there's still a lot of shenanigans you can pull. Um, and melee and movement is what I'm about so that's why I try to build my list with that sort of emphasis in mind and then when you give me like shooting heavy list it's like oh I, I don't really like this my target priority is not nearly as good sort of thing yeah um, so one other thing I wanted to talk about with your list just before we get into sort of like your actual event itself is that so we've obviously got our three nerglings I'm going to assume they're obviously just for your secondary plays um, did you ever find yourself infiltrating them or is it just for specific scenarios um so my list was developed with uh fixed secondaries i never have taken tactical with this army and um, that the nurglings are a big part of that um so my i know you play you tend to play tactical aiden right when you play your death guard y yeah i'm kind of like wavering on that a little, a little bit i won't lie I've had, I've had too many games now where the cards have been a little bit unfavorable in the turns you really need them to be important exactly so one of the one of the benefits of playing like a with a TTS lot and playing with a lot of good players is I, you kind of develop, you get to see kind of new strategies being tested. And I found that was a very common complaint of, oh, I drew, you know, how, how many times, have, like I'm sure your, your viewers can uh, <laughs> empathize, we've drawn capture enemy outpost and behind enemy lines turn one. It's like, well, I can't do this, obviously. <laughs> um, so for me, I was like, I'm tired of that happening. I want to have the control in my hands for my score. Yes. And I don't want to get screwed by cards. Um, so the change that made that possible, in my view, was the change of deploy teleport homers. It used to be two points for the center, I think, and then plus one if it was tactical. Like I can't remember the old teleport homers exactly. You are right. Yeah, it was two, and now it's three and four if it's tactical, isn't it? it exa uh, yeah, I think it's four or five if it's in the. It's like an extra point if it's in the enemy deployment zone or something yeah. now. Um, so the change to three was good because that made it a really stable fifteen, in my view. So. When I was designing this list, I was like, look, Death Guard are not fast enough to do tactical secondaries. Tactical secondaries kind of enforce a proactive game plan where you have to go out on objectives, you have to be doing things all the time. And Death Guard sort of can't do that. They, as my list is called the Plod Squad, they sort of plot around the table, but they don't get anywhere quickly, in my view, to like cleanse and stuff like that. Yeah. So I wanted a fixed plan. So my view was, okay, I'm taking homers in every game, so I need to build to do homers. Nurglings are excellent for homers. So what I'll do is I'll typically put two squads towards the center, and one squad will deep strike. And the squad that deep strikes is very important because it is really hard to screen out three Nurgling bases. But your opponent must screen them out because they threaten on turns two and three, they threaten the four point teleport homers. And your opponent does not want to give you a four point teleport homers when they yeah. land at the enemy deployment zone. And that's a 35 point unit that is forcing your opponent to screen the back and sacrifice board control in other areas to your Plague Marines. Um, the other thing is with Death Guard changes, um, our army is so much cheaper now. You can fit so <laughs> yeah. many units in. Like I just have so much stuff. And what I found was I often didn't like foul blight spawns would often go around by themselves. They wouldn't attach to units. 
um, they would just go and do like cleanse. So the secondaries I sort of built around were teleport homers every game. The remaining three depended somewhat on the matchups. So if I played against knights like my game one or Tau with lots of crisis suits like my game three, I would take bring it down because bring it down is very easy to max against those armies because you kill a suit and that's two points or you kill a knight and it's like three points straight away. Yeah. Um, other secondaries to build around are cleanse. So cleanse is one I take when the matchup is much more passive, um, where you're kind of you and your opponent are kind of sitting back and engaging slowly with the enemy. And then storm hostile is one I take in high attrition matchups, um, where I know I won't have the models left at the end to maximize cleanse because cleanse and homers together requires me to do three actions a turn typically, which is a big ask in a game where you're losing lots of units quickly. Yes. Um, so Storm, they're the four I take. Um, so bring it down, Homer's always, Storm, and uh, Cleanse. They would be the, set. The, the, the list was built around those, and I never wavered from those across uh, my test games with this. Okay, that's really good. No, I like that. That's, like, that's like sort of where my mind's been going. Uh, I think Teleport Homers is kind of like the game in general, sort of like the easy lock-in, like you said. Um, as long as you have someone that can sit in the middle, especially since we have the Infiltrate on the Nurglings, they can just start from turn one deploying Teleport Homers without having to, you know, make any risky deployments, especially on UKTC terrain. They, there's always usually a ruin within six inches of the center, so you can quite easily get a unit to be able to start teleport homers on turn one. Now, the only other thing I wanted to know is, obviously you still have a unit of Death Shroud Terminators. I'm assuming they're just to sort of be like a bit of a rapid ingress threat, maybe a bit of a hammer with Typhus in there, or was Typhus more used for the Poxwalkers, or was it, as a lot of people who are sort of like learning 10th, was it a matchup by matchup decision? So originally I started Typhus and the Poxwalkers, but in the a meta with um, aggressor bombs with the apothecary oh, yeah. biologist, <laughs> I realized the Poxwalkers were basically an anchor around Typhus's neck that dragged him to his death every single game. So um, that was came very. This is after I submitted the list. I realized this unfortunately. So I was like, okay, Typhus is never joining the Poxwalkers again. Poxwalkers are something that I didn't really enjoy in the list, to be honest. Um, so Typhus. Could have joined the Death Shroud, but I kind of liked having a few Deep Strike pieces. So I'd have three Nurglings, three Death Shroud, and Typhus in Deep Strike. Typhus Deep Struck solo every game, to be honest. And he just did his whole, you know, Mortal Wounds. He could do his Mortal Wounds and do the um, Teleport Homers action oh, if necessary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, because it's not a shooting attack, he just, yep. he just picks a thing and does some Mortal Wounds to it. So, like, screening out 140 mil base is so hard to do. And then Typhus is hiding there in my enemy's deployment zone, kind of going, come and deal with me. Um, yeah, and he's not something you can just send someone light to go and deal with. <laughs> exactly. So he'll come down, he'll pick up a small squad or something. Um, he's just really very versatile in that regard. Uh, the Death Shroud, I found, yeah, as you say, they were a rapid ingress unit. What I would typically do is I would, uh, the closest objective that I was expanding to to secure my primary, basically, I would push my Plague Breeds towards that. And if they didn't make it there, this is this, this only works when you're going second, this strategy, mind you. Um, what would happen is my opponent would be afraid to go to that objective because lots of plague marines are advancing on that position so they'd abandon it and what i would do on their turn two is i would rapid ingress in so when it came around to my turn to secure primary the death shroud had taken that objective it would be sticky for me and then the death shroud could push away and your opponent might think there's no reason to even try and push it because he's not even got control of it and like you said they don't want to come near all the plague marines they're like all right it's fine he doesn't control it either and now suddenly you control it and you've just swung primary a little bit exactly opinion. and it's, it's that threat of the Plague Marines because if the Plague Marines get the whiff of a charge, they'll go for it because that's how I get a huge amount of movement out of the list is charging people and like moving across the table that way. 100%. So the only last question and then I promise everyone listening we will move on. Um, it's just two <laughs> quick questions. Um, one about the Chaos Lord because that's an interesting include especially with Living Plague. Now, is he attached to a squad or is he doing the cheeky thing where he's kind of sitting in the middle and just trying to blink wounds off with his with silly uh, Living Plague extended Mortal Wound Aura? Uh, it depends on the matchup. So he originally was at it because I played into um, a test game against Danny uh, Porter, who came 19th with Votan, I believe, at the LGT. Nice. Um, and I found out I couldn't... It was That was actually my worst loss with this list by 20 points, was it, that Votan in practice games. And uh, I found I didn't have a way of dealing with the dwarves very well. Um, and I kind of like... I was losing lots of models for the attrition. So I wanted to try this guy included for that matchup. Um, where he could just start plinking away at the uh, one wound dwarf warriors and whatnot and just do a bunch of kind of mortal wounds that way or like plink away at Eldar units. Um, he never really kind of did what was necessary um, it, from my point of view. Like it, 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 was, it wasn't something you could rely upon. Um, I would think I would cut him in future iterations of this list. Okay, um, well, we'll talk about the changes at the end, but I, I, have, I have tried this dude too. I tried to move into the Terminator arm and I think 
I can see where your conclusion's coming from that one. And my only other last, very, very I promise you, my very, very last list question no, good. is um, obviously Mortarion is mainly being used with the like Walk and his little PBCs. You do include Mortarion, which I still think is a great choice. I think for 325 points, he's busted almost. Um, only his damage output is like the one thing that keeps him semi balanced. But I think he's always a daft. Um, what is his role in your list? So the the joke I have said to many of my teammates who've asked me this is like all fathers, Mortarian enables his children. Um, so he provides his auras, uh, reroll ones. Nice. He is also importantly a huge bullet sponge because a mm-hmm. lot of people will see Mortarian and immediately just throw fire at him, and he will just tank shots every day of the week. And I am very happy for that to bait yeah. out things. Um, like I bait it out. You bait out Yin Karns and stuff because he requires a. He, 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 he is very hard to deal with for a lot of armies, and it requires a very particular response to kill him. And like lots of heavy anti infantry or anti tank weapons brought to bear, the kind of things I don't want shooting my plague marines, basically. Yeah. Um, and also ignoring damage reduction in UKTC was there, um, I believe, like yeah, ignoring the armor good. of contempt and everything. <laughs> like that's really powerful to keep in the list, especially when I've got like heavy plague marine, uh, heavy plague weapons that are hitting on fours normally. I really don't want to be taking minus one to hit penalties on top of that because then I have like no damage output whatsoever. So yeah, he's, totally. He's kind of he doesn't do quite as much as he would in the triple PBC list, but he is still very like uh, as you say, he is effectively an auto take unit. Like he's kind of hard to leave home without Mortarian. Yeah. So would you say he's more of an aggressive piece in your uh, in your list rather than a sit back and buff piece, or do you reckon he's sort of in the middle? Uh, I think it depends much. I would call him more of a distraction Carnifex, I guess. Yeah. Uh, that he is very happy just going to the center objective and going, yeah, come deal with me. Yeah. And then I'm like, I don't really mind if you live or die in this game, Mortarion. You you do your job. <laughs> yeah, as long as you take enough bullets uh, to take down and let everything else like and be enabled around that, then you're doing your job. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's cool. Okay, so we'll, we'll promise now we will actually move on to your event. So do you want to? Um, we'll talk about your first day, obviously at first. So what do you want to talk is about the armies that you faced. Um, if it was, if you feel like it's worth like a, a matchup worth discussing, and it was quite a close game, well, you can feel free to talk about it. If it was a bit more of like a, you know, you like we've, we both said when you go to LGT because there's so many people, you can get uh, opponents which are like new to the hobby or something like that, and you can have games which are kind of like just blowouts, kind of like almost free. You can some people say it's punching kittens, not to say nothing bad upon your opponent. It's just obviously we've. 768 players there's a good chance like some people who are attending you know the first ever event are going to go against someone like 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 pierce here who's played for his literal national team and we could sit here and talk to you about how pierce like you know pinned the guy to the floor and beat the crap out of him but <laughs> <laughs> um, it's probably not going to teach you too much and we should probably focus on the the more the closer games that you had so do you want to take it away on your day one bud yeah, so game one, I was matched into Chaos Knights. Now, uh, he had six brigands, uh, a big knight, and then I think three of the melee knights. I can never remember the names of them. Um, carnivores? I think it was the carnivores, the double melee weapon guys. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so having played practice into Chaos Knights pre- prior to the event, I knew brigands were a, a scary threat for uh, my plague marine. So I kind of approached this matchup cautiously. I had no idea going into the skill level of my opponent. Um, I think he hadn't played the matchup previously, so... In his point of view, he played far more uh, conservatively than he should have. And as a result, my Plague Marine sort of just took the board against him. And he, his brigands couldn't really bring their firepower to a, uh, bear as a result because of his deployment. Um, so that was a pretty straightforward game of bring it down and teleport homers. But it was a, it was a lovely game. And uh, um, in, on reflect, it kind of helped set him up for the rest of the event when he kind of realized how his army should be functioning a bit more as the event went on. Um, so not much to say there. It was, uh, I think it was 90 something to 33 points in the end um uh, my game two was very interesting though um i played into aiden brocklehurst so aiden came uh, made top eight with his dark angels so um Ooh, nice. this was a this is a spicy round too we were playing uh purge the foe which i think is the kill mission um where you get like a point yes. for killing the unit and then killing more so he was playing the aggressor bomb uh double redemptor 10 deathwing knights um then, like, you know, Whirlwind, uh, Inceptors, um, Calidus Assassin, the kind of standard Marine units you sort of see. Um, and going into this one, I knew it would be tough. So I chose Storm Hostile Objective because my thinking was if he's, he was going, my thinking was he would choose Tactical with his list because most players pick Tactical. And he would get ones to take my objectives and I would take them back and score Storm Hostile. And then deploy homers, of course, as I said previously, always deploy homers. Now, Aiden played this matchup particularly. Uh, smartly, and what he decided 
uh, very early on was he was not going to bother doing anything but holding his home objective. And he was just going to accept that um, if he got a card to come take like the middle or something, he was just going to leave that objective B and try and outscore me elsewhere. So as a result, I end up getting a zero on Storm Hostile because I thought he'd play a bit more aggressive. So in hindsight, I perhaps should have taken Cleanse, um, but that might have changed how he approached the game and he might have just jammed 10 Deathwing Knights into my face. Yeah. So he played extremely conservatively as a result. We kind of traded kills, traded, I held more, he killed more typically on most turns. And it came down to, I think, turn top of three, we both sat down, we kind of both calculated our scores together and kind of predicted how the game was going to go. Which was, which was great fun. It kind of brought me back to ninth edition. We were both really sort of <laughs> into the game and we knew it was going to be close, but I realized then what was going to happen was since I was getting hold more and I got to kill more, I think, in his, there as well, one turn. Um, my primary was going to cap out. So I had to find a way. I was going to cap at 50. So I had to find a way to get more secondary points. My homers were locked in at like 16 or 17 points because I was able to get a unit or two in his deployment zone. Um, for teleport homers so I had to find a way to score storm hostile objective so it came down to my humble plague burst crawler on the final turn um, he shot into a uh, bunch of stuff on Aiden's objective to try and take it away he killed I think all but th he had five heavy intercessors on this home objective he killed three of them so we tied it on OC and it came down to the battle shock test from the PBC's uh, uh, plague burst mortar yep. which Aiden passed Aww. and it was like oh well it was a fantastic game though um uh, Aiden played a pure for perfect. He took full advantage of my storm hostile objective decision. Um, he, he played that really smartly, and it is it raises the importance of you're taking fixed secondaries. You do have to be very mindful of the um, mission you're playing because if you choose the wrong fixed secondary, it's like messing up your deployment. The game can already be over at the beginning. So that final score was eighty to seventy seven to Aiden. That's, um, that's really close, man. Yeah, again, it was a fantastic game. I like thoroughly enjoyed it. It was lots of back and forths. Um, it could swing either way at, at any points, but Aiden played it really smartly and was able to take a, take full advantage of my pick. So, um, yeah, terrific game. So just was, a quick was, one on that one, sorry. Yeah. Um, how did you feel with the Redemptors? Because Redemptors have been a pain in my ass. Um, how did you manage to deal with them? And how did it, how did you sort of like, how did you deal? Because I played against double yeah. Redemptor vehicle list and I, I did get unlucky, I will admit, but um, Oaths of Moment on Marty dropped like 24 devastating wounds on him with full Gatling. Uh, that wasn't fun. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, did you yeah. Fare? So, that's what I was afraid of as well. So, I actually uh, I, I wanted to try and get my Plague Marines up much more aggressively because my plan was to sort of kind of bait. Want him, I wanted him to fight me in the center, basically. So, I deployed Morty really aggressively for that reason. And I, the reason I did that was I wanted his Redemptors to shoot Morty over shooting my Rhinos turn one because that's where all my mobility comes out of. Yeah. Uh, it's using this rhino kind of, you know, the rhino uber. Guys hop out, more guys hop in. Um, so Morty took a lot of fire, and I think Morty died on his turn two. Um, he went first. Um, so turn one, Morty took like, I think like 11 wounds or something from like plasma cannons and uh, Gatlings firing into him because I couldn't, I didn't have enough space to hide Morty and all yeah. my other stuff and play aggressively with at the same time. So um, Morty was there to draw fire for the Redemptors for the first couple turns, and after that I was set up that I could basically block his movement with like five-man Plague Marine units. So like a five-man Plague Marine unit, you know, moving out and then charging something that wasn't going to slap them back too hard um, would block his Redemptor from moving down any further down a fire lane, which meant that the Redemptor really couldn't see much of anything. Nice. So the fighting really that entire game became centralized over like one objective, the... Uh, not the central one, but his no man's land objective nearest to his deployment zone. That became the sort of focus of the fight between us. And the uh, aggressor bomb really uh, tipped the line for him there because any plague marines that went over there just sort of got popped um, as a result. Yeah, that, so I kind of just ignored the redemptors, I guess. <laughs> I, I tried not to focus too much on killing them because I knew it would be a, a tough prospect between all of like everything. Like the 10 Deathwing Knights were sitting with them as well. It was just, it was too much to punch through. So I focused on my scoring and went elsewhere. Nice, nice. So focus on controlling the movement, denying them firing lanes, and like you said, focus on your scoring, which is which is an excellent thing for anyone listening. Like if you do come across a unit that you genuinely think I'm going to really struggle to kill that, think of ways that you can shut that unit down instead of try, like trying to just kill it. So like uh, Pierce said, there he was move blocking it, so it couldn't get important angles, it couldn't really get out to its full capacity. And yeah, he was having to lose five plague marines, you know, here and there to do that. But it's better to lose five plague marines than to you know lose ten man squad and then then get a charge onto something like a rhino as well. 
Yeah, so after that, um, I placed into Tau for my game three. Again, this was a pretty straightforward one. Um, but again, the rhinos were big for the threat range of my army. So 10 Plague Marines with the character, the Biologist Putrefire, for that sweet critical hits on a five plus. <laughs> um, but that's just such a powerful combination. They um, disembarked. They were able to... He, he kind of mispositioned his crisis brick slightly. So uh, they, they were behind a wall as well, but there was still space for me to get around the wall. So... Um, my guys got out, moved over, charged, and then and that was all that, all that she wrote against the tail, basically, because um, then the crisis brick was tied up. Uh, I had impunity over the rest of the objectives. Mortarian just sort of went ham that game with the crisis brick tied up and started lifting things across the table. I took bring it down and deploy homers for that. I max bring it down pretty quickly uh, by killing the suits. Um, and then homers was pretty straightforward as well with the, uh, the nurglings and whatnot. Um, and then onto game four was against Space Wolves. Now, this is where the Foul Blight spawns um, was very helpful in my army. Um, so for this mission, um, I can't remember the mission we played exactly, but for my, my secondaries were um, Cleanse and Homers, because it, in, in my mind, I was still thinking of the game uh, against Aiden, because this was mission we were playing, I think, was you only had to hold two objectives. Yeah. You never had to hold more for the Tenno primary. And I knew I'd have a difficult time pushing it onto one of his objectives to score Storm Hosta. So I thought, okay, I'll take Cleanse and I'll take Homers and I'll force him to come interact with me. And he's a melee army and a Death Guard firmly, I believe, have the advantage in a lot of melee matchups because we have units like Foul Blight Spawn or minus one damage in melee. So a 10-man squad with a Foul Blight Spawn and a Bilo just Putrefire on an infected objective, <laughs> I can pop the sustained hit stratagem that crits on fives now and just yeah, start luck. wiping things with... Um, <laughs> so I, that's effectively what happened. He came in with his units. I fought first. I picked up most of his stuff. And uh, the only thing I couldn't really touch in his army was a Land Raider Redeemer he had, which is scary because it starts picking up Plague Marines quite quickly. Um, but I kind of baited that away from my army. I sent a, a Rhino of 10 Plague Marines and a character off on one side of the table to threaten one of his objectives, knowing full well it would be insufficient to beat the Aggressor Bomb. But I knew he'd commit his Aggressor Bomb there. And by the time they committed, they were well out of the game. So I had the rest of the control of the table. I didn't really mind at that point. That's clever. Nice, nice. Um, so just a quick one. Um, just while we've talked about your games there, um, the previous four, you, what contagions did you find yourself taking the most? Um, I have never used the OC or leadership one because uh, I just I don't ever see that being that useful. I always pretty much take minus one weapon skill and ballistic skill, um, and I do that for. Uh, I think that's the most powerful of the contagions because the change to 10th edition has made ballistic skill modifiers a lot less common. You used to have them from like, you know, uh, indirect weapons firing would take a ballistic skill penalty. But that's, that's gone now. It's just a hit modifier. And as we all know, hit modifiers don't stack up barring the yeah. initial minus one. Um, so ability to stack minus one with like smoke or uh, the Nurgle strategy for stealth, minus one to hit there and couple that with minus one ballistic skill is really powerful as a lot of things go from hitting on threes to hitting on fives. Which yeah, is it's just pretty wild. Brutal. <laughs> or like if you're Tower of Votan, you go to hitting on sixes, right? That that's that feels bad. <laughs> yeah, true. Do you ever do you ever um, find yourself in a scenario where you'd consider the minus one save? I believe I took minus one save against Aiden because the Deathwing Knights and the Redemptors kind of I was felt I wouldn't get close enough to make use of the minus one weapon skill, ballistic skill, because of the threat those two units possessed. Yeah. So I, I took minus one save thinking in my turn I can walk over, the guys can sit there, put minus one save up, put a put a damage into them. And then he'll kill me, sure, but it means I put some damage on him. Um, the other cheeky combo with minus one weapon skill and ballistic skill is the Nurglings have a six-inch aura of uh, minus one to hit in melee, yep. for excluding vehicle and monster units. So often what you can do is you can nestle a unit of three Nurglings behind a Plague Marine brick, and if anything wants to charge you, they probably go from hitting on uh, threes to hitting on fives. And that makes a big difference if you're like you're even carnivores or something. The carnivore will go from hitting on like a... Twos to fours, which is, you know, twos to threes because sweet. they they, they, won't, oh, take yeah, the they won't take the from the yeah, yeah. Nurgling. But like I've had the Avatar go into um uh like a poxwalker brick with that minus one weapon skill and just completely whiff because he's now hitting on threes, or if Typhus is leading the squad, he's hitting on fours because Typhus has innately has minus one to hit when he's leading yeah. the squad. You can always yeah. if you're against the you know, if you want a bit more of that hammer unit, um you can put him with the death shroud, I imagine, in some games. So and they'll yeah. always be minus two to be hit then. So if you're against like space walls or something that's not going to be fun for them to deal with. You don't want to charge Death Shard that are minus two to be hit with and then die. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just it's such a powerful contagion, I think. And like a lot of like I know that we it's probably a meme to death in this edition that there's less rerolls, but there there truly is less rerolls and there's less reliability in damage. So when you take someone from threes to fours or fours to fives, it really just causes their damage to drop off and you trade so efficiently because you in turn with Mortarian ignore these modifiers so you don't really care about them yourself, but you're taking full advantage of them in return. Yeah, it's just it just it's one of those rules where a lot of people do they'll play games, they'll get used to outputs of certain units, and then that they that becomes like you're expected, you know, like that guy should pick up that. But when you bring in a debuff like that, which just messes with the math so much, there's many times your opponent either like under commits or way over commits because they just can't figure out the maths on the spot, which is, you know, can be quite good because all you have to have is, you know, a single plague marine survive on a point that they thought they'd shoot off. And then you just all pass morale, worst case scenario, and there you go, you just swung another five primary. Exactly. And this list fundamentally is a primary denial list. Like, it, it's not, I'm not, like, I've got guns, sure. I'm not relying on the damage of the guns. I'm relying on incremental damage with grenades from, like, my biologist putrefiers doing grenades for free, or Typhus chucking out a bunch of mortal wounds, and then just using my OC and throwing my weight around of bodies effectively to take objectives. And this is where, when you come and trade into me and you whiff as a result of my contagion, uh, subtracting from your ballistic skill or weapon skill, suddenly you find yourself in a really bad position because I get to hit you back quite hard and I get to charge you. I call it kicking the beehive, basically. like You come over and uh, aggravate one little five-man Plague Marine squad and then 35 other Plague Marines and their dad come over <laughs> and beat the crap out of you, you know? <laughs> I love it. So, uh, go on, what was your... So, anything else in that space of game or was that kind of... Cutting, it was It was pretty textbook dry. straightforward. Yeah. It kind of went how I expected. Once the aggressors and Redeemer committed away from the big fight happening between me and like his Thunderwolves I was quite happy how that game was going to progress um, and then on to game 5 I was 3-1 and one at that point and then I was rewarded with uh, Aldari as my game 5 so pretty standard Aldari list uh, double Night Spinner uh, Fugin um, he had some Fire Dragons and a Falcon actually and then the Yin Karn uh, Shadow Spectres Warp Spiders the works that sort of thing um, tricky matchup obviously um I've played into Eldar quite a few times pre-LGT as practice, and uh, I, they've all been close games. I've lost them by single-digit figures, or I've won them uh, by bigger margins than that. But I knew straight away that the centerpiece to focus this game plan on was the Yincarn, and the mission was quite favorable to me. It was the hold, uh, hold 15 on primary mission, where you can hold three objectives and get 15 on primary. Yeah. Um, so I knew I, with his list, I, there's no way I go five turns with him. So I have he's going to out attrition me because his damage, it's Aldar, their damage is very high. But I knew my list has the strength of holding objectives versus his. He cannot just go on to objectives and expect to live against me. He has to kill me and then take the objectives in the later game. So my plan was I will die, but I'm going to have to dent him and hopefully do a big enough job that by the end of the game, he doesn't have the resources to score enough to get back in the game. Um. And to that end, it was uh, the biggest goal for me was to, one, uh, disrupt his primary. So I knew I wanted to take objectives off him, so I'm taking Storm Hostile, and I'm taking Deployed Heatherborn Homers, as always. Because um, I think I'd have one unit who could just push the button for five turns and get me 15 points there. Yeah. And the second thing I identified was I have to kill his Yincarn. Because as long as the Yincarn lives, this game is against me heavily, because the Yincarn just teleports around and gives him a huge amount of mobility in the latter half of the game to score. Yeah, um, Yinkan kind of broken. <laughs> yes, yes. And funnily enough, I think Death Guard are probably the best army in the game for killing the Yinkan, though, uh, barring yes. maybe Marines with the aggressor bomb. So what I effectively did was turn one. Um, he went first, which is never you never want to go second against Eldar. It always feels yeah. bad. Um, so he shot and he killed like uh, some some stuff um, as Eldar do. And then uh, turn one, I basically I deployed Morty on the line, and Morty had gone for the center objective. And this was, I think, quarters deployment as well. Um, so Morty just went to the center objective. And the reason I did that was knowing he died of fire dragons and Fugin and everything. I was like, I want him to commit to the center objective with me. I want him to force him to come all in now instead of spending five turns of him chipping away with me. I don't get anything if I play conservatively in this matchup. Yeah. Um, and then all my plague marines across the table that could do anything started advancing towards objectives. And I tried to screen out any of his deep striking units. Um, and I put like my pox walkers on the center objective as well. I think I rolled a big advance for them, and they got there in front of Mortarian. And I wanted them there to bait in in shadow specters. And then on his turn uh, three, when his res- sorry, his turn two. Then so my turn one, that was what I did. His turn two, he dropped in with everything. He wanted to kill the- his pox walkers, so he took the bait. And then I was to see if he would take the second level of bait, which is to go for Mortarian. I wanted him to commit to Mortarian. Um, 
he killed the Poxwalkers, his Yincarn then teleported in, and between the fire dragons of the Yincarn, Morty died. It wasn't even close, Morty was gone. Yeah. Um, but I was very happy with that trade, because Morty wouldn't really do anything in this matchup in general, in general, barring holding an objective. So what I had set up around Mortari was all my Biologist Putrefires, both of them with their free <laughs> grenade strat. I had Typhus coming in from Deep Strike, and I had another five-man Plague Marine squad. So the five first one comes out, throws their grenades. Then the two Putrefire squads come out and throw their grenades for free, because they can do it even when someone else has already done it. Yep. And then Typhus comes in and he does his mortal wounds as well, and that's the Incarn gone in a single shooting phase. Nice, really nice. So I trade at Morty for the Incarn. I consider that a huge win in my book. Um, yeah, 100%. because his mobility is gone. I was giving him fives on primary every turn because I had so many Plague Marines running over all the objectives and taking over everything, and I have lots of flamers still with the Death Shroud and stuff that were still picking up guys. Um, so I was scoring my Storm Hostile. I was giving him a five on primary. So it's a nine point swing because I score four, my opponent loses five points and the Incarn was gone so a lot of his mobility was gone and he had dropped in like his Shadow Spectres to kill my Poxwalkers and some Plague Marines so they were out of the game as well the Deep Strike threat was no longer something I had to worry about and I just focused then on keeping him off the objectives killing some stuff around and fortunately I was able to pull far enough ahead on Primer even though he outscored me on uh, tactical secondary uh, because he was doing tactical cards with Eldar um, he wasn't able to pull back enough of a score in the latter half of the game when I was dead I had like two units left, I think, on my turn four. Um, I had cratered his score sufficiently that it didn't matter at that point. That's a really, that's a really good way to put that. That's definitely, like, when people think about a game plan, that's definitely a high-level game plan, is identifying the fact that you know you can't take this damage output, so you have to do all your work in the first, like, three, three turns, pretty much. And then your fourth turn, you're trying to just do what you can. And then fifth turn is basically, like, like you said, pray. <laughs> pray you've done enough. Yeah, um, yeah. But it's, um, it's cool to see that it actually worked because you managed to obviously come out with a win on that one. Um, I, it's just yeah, it was a hard so win. Cool. It was seventy five, <laughs> yeah, seventy five sixty four in the end. Now there was a five point out, it could have been seventy uh, seventy five sixty nine in the end because I had three Nurglings fighting three Fire Dragons and Fugan, and <laughs> hilariously the uh, oh, and there was a Plague Marine in that melee as well. So um, uh, a Plague Marine and a Biolo just putrefire actually, who was by himself because he was part of another squad that died, but. The Biolo just charged Fugan to die because I, wa- I didn't want him hitting, hitting the Plague Marine. Um, the Plague Marine was fighting the Fire Dragons in such a distance that Fugan couldn't be in engagement range to hit him. Yeah. But this is all on an objective and then I had the three Nurglings fighting as well away from Fugan again. Um, the three Nurglings actually managed to kill the three Fire Dragons. Got very lucky for that to happen. But it <laughs> nice. denied him an extra five points on primary which meant I had a little bit of a comfort zone going into turn five where I was like I think I've got this here. I think I've got this here. Yeah. Um, so it was very satisfying to take down Eldari. I've played a lot of practice games against Eldari, so I knew that the the thing I had to do was kill the Yincarn. If, the, if he had played much more conservative with his Yincarn, he would have taken the game. But once he saw the bait for Morty, it was quite. I was quite happy to take that trade any day of the week. That's really cool, Master. That's such a cool, like like you said, way to approach the game, and like it, it, that managed to pay off, which is really nice to see, especially against Eldar because uh, screw Eldar. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> So obviously your, your list seems to have s- some legs onto it, which is really nice, and it's also really positive to see because having been able to see multiple lists and even list designs managed to go four and one. Because don't get me wrong, no Death Guard went five and zero, oh, but I don't think your army has to go five and zero oh to be viable, if that makes sense. Um, but seeing that you could have your list go four and one, my list went four and one, I think it shows that Death Guard's in quite a good spot, like internal balance wise. Um, Obviously, Morty might be a bit too much of an auto take, um, but I'm not going to complain because he's really good for, for his points right now. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, um, would you? Yeah, I. Well, sorry, yeah, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. Good. I was going to say, I, I, I agree. I think it's great to see the diversity in lists, um, and I, I, I totally agree as well. I don't think you have to go five and zero to prove that your list is excellent. I think what can happen, like uh, tournaments, are often, you know, and especially in a field as large as LGT, sometimes you just hit the wrong matchup on the wrong mission. I mean, it's 40k. It is a game inherently of rock paper scissors. Um, so sometimes, you know, we play our bad matchup on a mission that's terrible for us and then the dice go against us or something bad happens and that could just be the game and, you know, you can't do anything about that sometimes you can only play the games placed in front of you so, um, yeah all the 4 and one lists I think generally very interesting, um, it's great to see we have a lot of variety because some factions just have the one list they can play and do well, yeah. Death Guard seem to have a lot of variety in what they can do at the moment like there's there's lists like there's like armies like Tau, which technically they do have like variety in the list, but it's always based around like crisis break. There's like 
you have crisis bricks and then it's just the tools they put around that whereas in this instance your list is vastly different to my list in both play style and design um, yeah. which which is awesome because like i'm now after looking at this and hearing you talk about it i was already wanting to do a bit of a change because i'm, I'm the kind of person and maybe you're the same like even if i've got a list that's i think is doing well and strong i'm not gonna play it for like like you know six months straight i will get bored naturally um so i'm gonna i wanted to try out some new stuff i do think plague marines have legs um and obviously you going for one has obviously reinforced that so it's nice to see so i think i'm gonna sort of join you going down the plague marine rhino route from here on out because also <laughs> um i found out plague burst mortaring people off uh, not the most fun experience for your opponent <laughs> either yeah, and I'm just, I guess I'm traumatized from the mortars in 9th edition, like, you know, when they have only D6 shots, and so often it would be like, oh, here's one shot that misses, and it does nothing, and you're kind of like, oh, well, that was fun. <laughs> yeah, true. Whereas the Plague Marines are always going to, like, you know, I'm pretty I'm pretty convinced that 10 Plague Marines with Biological Pooch Fire touching anything in the, mo- at the game at the moment kills it, I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah, oh, they're so, they're so awful to deal with, just because you have all those heavy Plague weapons, and then when you auto wound on fives, it's just, oh, it feels so good, and... Um, you've got the foul blight spawn, so you're untouchable in melee a lot of the time. It's like, go on, charge me! I dare you to. <laughs> yeah, I love the fact, like, if you come across a matchup that's not going to be melee in you, you just then put the foul blight spawns on their own, and you can just literally send them off to do an action on the target. It's like, cool. Worst case scenario, you pick up a fifty point character. Do you think I care? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What I would often do is I would put him in the rhino by himself, just for the firing deck. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, or what a cool trick we found out. Uh, one of my teammates while practicing was if you fall back and embark. Um, firing deck doesn't care about the condition of the model that jumped in the transport. The transport just uses its oh, weapon. Yeah. So I had one game where <laughs> I was fighting uh, a couple of Eldar bikes on an objective with the Foul Blight Spawn. Foul Blight Spawn hops into the Rhino next to him. The Rhino firing decks into the bikes and kills the bikes that he was fighting. <laughs> That's actually so clever. <laughs> it's fun because the, the other foul that Will's going to be interviewing later this week, he was just running a Rhino with just two Foul Blight Spawns in it and no Play Greens. So there's, there's so much to that Foul Blight Spawn bus. <laughs> Yeah, I think I absolutely think so. I've got grenades keyword as well, like which is the grenade keyword. I think is one of the uh, underrated gems of our codex. We have a lot of guys with the grenades. Like I think Morty has grenades as he well. He does, yeah. That strat is just very useful um, for killing really durable things like the Yin card. It's it's awful to play against if you're like an Eldar player and and there's just a guy chucking a grenade at you and going, yeah, take take four or five mortal wounds, baby. <laughs> and we're going to do it again. <laughs> yeah, we're going to do it again and we're going to keep doing it. We'll never stop partying. <laughs> and then Typhus comes in he's like, have D6 more. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's just my, my opponent was horrified when I was explaining that to him. I was like, yeah, so he's going to throw a grenade then he'll throw a grenade because his ability lets him do it and then he'll throw a grenade because his ability lets him do it and then Typhus will do mortal wounds and your yard card's gone. <laughs> yeah, I had I had a, an experience versus Necrons recently where um, the fellow had 20 Necron Warriors of Oricon, which gives him a four pin vulnerable, and then they were they had the, all the buffs on him reanimators nearby, and he was basically he was explaining to me. He said, if you um, you know shoot this unit, it will resurrect like two D three plus like seven Necron Warriors. Yeah, for a command point, and he can do that both fight phase and shooting phase. So I was like. Okay, so I set it up in a way that basically I I had two biologists approach fires go into it with grenades with Marty's grenades, and then I, I did a tank shock with a hellbrute, which did, <laughs> which did nine because he did six himself plus D three for his own, which is which I rolled a three. And I was like, so that twenty man warriors squad's dead, and I didn't shoot them once. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We like we 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 used to like I think in ninth our thing was a lot of mortal wounds. We don't have that necessarily as evidently obvious as we did in ninth, but. As a faction, I think Death Guard still has a ton of portal wounds we kick out, and that kind of is one of our strengths, is that we have some really reliable damage that we can just guarantee you're going to take damage at this point between our lethal hits and our portal wounds. Yeah, totally. Um, so let's go, just going back to your list then, because obviously now you've, you've been to a full event with it, you've played the full five rounds, you said before you were considering dropping some units, changing some things. Should we quickly go over those and what you think you're going to change, what what didn't work, what you think would be better? Because obviously, you know, if you're even even 200 points changing in Death Guard at the moment, it's actually a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so let me just uh, remind myself what I um, I'm changing the list to. I have just posted it in one of my uh, group chats there. I'll yeah. scroll back quickly to find it. Yeah, so um, things that are getting cut is one squad of Nurglings is getting cut. So I've got three at the moment. One was fine for infiltrating to start homers. One was fine for deep striking 
uh, to threaten that four point homer in my Paloma's deployment zone, as I said earlier. Yep. Um, so I'm cutting one of those to save 35 points, basically. I found the yeah. third one was often, I never really had a use for the third one. Um, it was kind of, oh, here's my backup homer unit, but I don't actually really need that because I've got all these plague greens swarming around. Yeah, I've, I've came to the same, I think two is like the golden number for Durglins. I've done the same, I've drawn three. I then ended up going back to two because I always it, it end up in a situation where I'm just deep striking it turn three and I don't even need to like I've I've got the secondaries done by other units and I'm just kind of like I guess I've yeah. just got to drop it somewhere. <laughs> yeah, and they're actually a really interesting defensive unit as well when you have one in deep strike. So you can if say your opponent has a melee unit that's moving up aggressively to threaten you, what you do is you rapid ingress in that Nurgling squad behind like your plague marines to bring in their minus one weapon skill aura or minus one to hit aura. Sorry, in melee. <laughs> and they could be used defensively to shore up a position as well. And just watch your opponent's face go from smile to frown. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like if you've minus a weapon scout, then suddenly Nurgling's rapid ingress in, and it's like, oh well, now they've anchored that point up really nicely. Um, it's quite a sneaky play, but I've two squads of them now. The uh, the Pox Walkers I found very lackluster. Um, I, I kind of liked the idea initially. Lots of bodies, right? I've got forty plague marines. I've got Morty Nurglings. That's lots of points, uh, wounds per uh, point, right? In my army. I found if folks are dealing to kill Necron Warriors, which are infinitely more durable than Poxwalkers, they can yeah, deal with yeah. Poxwalkers. Yeah, I think um, especially with the, like we said, the aggressor bomb before, which is um, <clears throat> becoming very staple in Marine lists, and that thing just looks at Poxwalker and he's like, oh, thanks for the extra, like, uh, 20 shots on blast. I'll take that, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just all the dice. You just go, I'm picking up my squad, it's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I found they were basically an anchor that killed Typhus. Every time I joined Typhus to them, thinking like, oh, you know, Typhus can bring dudes back when he does his uh, his ability. I was like, no, actually, Typhus is just better deep striking and doing his own thing. Um, he just, he's just a very annoying unit to deal with. So the Poxwalkers get cut, so that gives me 135 points. Um, mm -hmm. That I'm going to use to buy three more Death Shroud because I really enjoyed using them, uh, as we talked about earlier, about the rapid ingress threat onto objectives um, yeah. and having that second unit to maybe threaten a, a rapid ingress in a subsequent turn or just as another deep strike piece so I, I can rapid ingress one and still have one left over to threaten some areas of the board yeah uh, i think quite beneficial there um the lord is also getting cut um just i didn't feel he did enough like his his uh, end of turn mortals is kind of nice um chipping away at one wound models it's not something that could be relied upon it's on a four up but like it's just i'm not sure where i took this guy again yeah. terminator version <clears throat> with all the same upgrades i took him to an rtt and i think i rolled throughout all three games i think i rolled like 18 times and he went off once <laughs> oh my god <laughs> and oh. i was just like wow what a waste of 100 points <laughs> yeah yeah that like that would be enough to get him dropped um so for me yeah he didn't do a whole lot like there was a couple of niche scenarios where i put him in a, a 10-man plague marine squad the reroll ones to hit was kind of nice um not something that was ever kind of going oh man i have to have him for this reason so he's getting cut uh, as well. Um, so that between him and the uh, Nurgling squad and the um, Poxwalkers, I believe I had enough to fit in uh, a Lord of Virulence and an extra squad of three Death Shroud. And the Lord of Virulence I kind of liked because well, I do have a few blast weapons in with the uh, Putrefires, obviously, in the list. Yep. He adds an extra flamer. He's another deep striking 40 millimeter base on a Terminator body who's kind of annoying to deal with. But with a second squad of Death Shroud in the list, he can now join that second squad of Death Shroud and they can take advantage of his reroll to wound with their flamers. Yeah. Now, here's a question. Um, Would you ever consider just having one large unit of Death Shroud or do you prefer the minimum size units and having two of them to play around with? I prefer having the extra units, I think, because while it gives me more reactive pieces on the table, I think yeah. Death Guard do struggle having reactive threats on the board. Um, if an engagement happens somewhere and you like we're slow, we can't really race to the scene of the accident. You know, we have to kind of stare in horror and go oh well that side of the board is now gone yeah no totally um, so i could definitely see a different sort of list maybe opting for more um there's like one archetype i've seen that has me peaked to try at some point uh, called the fake thousand sons where it's basically hero hammer death guard where you take like big dead shred bricks with pbcs and then all the characters um, okay so I'm, I'm kind of i don't know how good that is i'm kind of inclined to try it though after i've had fun with this it's so cool um, there's so much stuff to try though in it I think there's like four different builds in the Codex alone. Between the Plod Squad, uh, there's your kind of triple PBC Morty build, which is very just a solid. I think that's like the, I think that's like probably the best all-rounder Death Guard list in terms of it's giving you lots of tools for everything. Um, 
And then there's like, I think more of a demon engine focus list. And then there's the fake thousand sun list, which also has potential. It's, it's great. We've got so much style. Sco- Sco- thousand sun. <laughs> yeah. It's wish.com thousand suns, right? Yeah. When you order devastating wounds from wish. <laughs> it's just biological future fires. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, so yeah, that would be the, the change I'd make. We'd get the Lord of Virulence in and the extra squad. I would still keep them broken up because I still like uh, the, the philosophy is I want lots of things on the table. I want lots of units to still play my secondary plan with. Um, if I was going tactical, perhaps there's more of an incentive to have bigger units to deny points, but I'm firmly of the opinion fixed is the best way to um, uh, play Death Guard. Though you did take tactical for the event and you finished higher than me, I think, in the final standing. So uh, the jury is probably still out on the two. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think you just got unlucky, like you said, at Aiden being able to realize that if he... It was the com- like you said. It's always combination of mission plus opponent. Aiden realizing that's the one mission where he doesn't really have to care about holding more than one primary, um, because obviously, if that was the, let's say that was the mission where you want you can hold fifteen a turn, suddenly he cannot just sit on his one. Um, but <clears throat> you know, unfortunately, the circumstances were the circumstances. So I wouldn't I wouldn't push it, wouldn't punish yourself too hard on the choice of fixed. I, I, like I said, I think I'm going to go to fix more because I'm kind of getting. I've had a couple of games now where you know a couple of bad draws at the wrong time. You know you draw you draw the cards that want you to be in all corners on the first two turns, and then by the last the end of them you get in all the ones that you could have just scored the first turns, and they're worth like three points. It's been strangled. And you're like, uh, and it's not great. Yeah, especially over like a five round or seven round event, depending on what tournaments you play in. You really want that consistency and being able to kind of say i'm getting 15 here i'm going to get primary here it's also a simpler game plan i find so having to juggle around the table like my plan is very simple I, i'm going to have a guy in the center who does homers that's a unit there doing that then i have another secondary to focus on and after that i'm just aggressively going after my opponent's primary and that's a very straightforward game plan that means like when you get to round five in an event you know you're getting tired you're not necessarily kind of stressing as much about how to play the game you're kind of like oh it's the same plan it's still straightforward i yeah. run i I walk at you rather than run at you and uh, take objectives off you. Yeah, I'm not to, I'm not to sit there measuring like, okay, so if I kill this unit in this corner in case I draw investigate signals next turn, can this move, move unit here in your turn move within distance of it to screen out the corner, or can I actually yes. get my character in this? It's just like I just, or I could just be like, I'm a, I'm gonna do a teleport homer. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Like I, I was joking, my Nurglings are the best uh, teleport homer uh, setup experts in the entire uh, 41st millennium because they just sat there for every game, and you'd be surprised they, they don't get touched because. When you put Morty and 40 Plague Marines into your opponent, they have to respond to that. Oh, they, they can't yeah. respond to the, the three Nurglings behind a wall doing, in their view, nothing. Even though the Nurglings are the ones scoring me minimum 15 <laughs> points every game. You know, it's funny. Here's the, here's, the, here's the question. So in a game full of, like, super soldiers and all, like, you know, psychic elves and stuff, why is the best uh, deploy teleport homers between the choice of a unit of Nurglings or a single spore mine? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I think the Nurglings because the Nurglings, if if you if you can imagine, they can all dress up with like pom poms and like you know cheerleader <laughs> outfits, and they can just cheer on Mortarion and the boys from the side. Moral lines. support. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, and they have their aura of minus one to hit, which is them basically cheering, going, "Come on, Papa, you got this." Yeah, I don't see spore mines cheering anyone on. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. They're like they're by themselves. They're they're naturally a loner. They they don't do well fr- with friends. <laughs> I was, like, I was gonna make the over, over joke about the fate of all spore mines, but we won't go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, okay, that's, that's like you said. That I think I'm gonna start trying out fix. I want to try more of a plague marine list because I do miss playing it. I miss the archetype and I miss the. I just miss the models as well. It sounds weird. I like. I like. I want to play some different models now. I do miss. Play, I have so many plague marines. Unfortunately, I have a lot of bulk and plague marines as well. But we're not taking yeah. them anytime soon. <laughs> No, it is unfortunate. Like, I have a lot left from the ninth edition list, fortunately. I still have to borrow some, but um, yeah, I don't know what to have to do to uh, make bulk guns viable. I guess you could start hacking limbs off your plague brains. And, like, we're Nurgle, you can always do good conversions to kind of make it look appropriate, right? Yeah, true, true. <laughs> okay, so um, are you happy then with that? Sort of like a, um, so like your explanation for your event. Is there anything else you'd like to sort of mention about your list, about any thoughts or, you know, going forward? Um, any events coming up what are you going to be taking to those etc um so we have a two-day event now the end of october in ireland we kind of one of our last ones there it's about 30 players on wtt terrain um it'll be a bit of a shark tank because most of the hopefuls for the wtc team for the coming year uh, and it, it currently existing members will be attending so 
I'm sort of torn in what I want to take to that. I've got like six different armies for 40k. I've got Custodes, Death Watch, uh, Thousand Sons, Demons, Chaos Space Marines, and Death Guard. Um, I'm currently still kind of in my head going, I want to play Death Guard because at the moment they're, they're, I think a lot of people are sort of uh, overlooking them. They think, oh, it's Death Guard. I agree. You know? Um, and there's an element you can kind of catch people at. It would also be very satisfying to win such an event with Death Guard, or at least be in contention for it. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of Aldari players who are going to be there, um, so it's kind of one thing in my mind going, oh, how many Yin cards can I kill over a weekend? <laughs> how um, many Yin cards can I kill? Yeah, it's... it's. Uh, I've killed... I've played Eldar like three or four times now, um, and I've killed three out of four, and the one that I didn't kill survived on one wound, so I'm, oh. I'm, I'm hoping to add more to that tally. <laughs> you have to start putting Yin Khan and like skulls on the bases of Mortarion and stuff like this is yeah. how many I've slain <laughs> I'll, I'll add a Nurgling to his base every time he kills one <laughs> that would be pretty sick to be fair uh, <laughs> yeah I mean I must admit that Eldar is still a bit of a menace but I think I think like you said I think Death Guard are in a position where people are underrating them um I've had people just like think they're gonna get an easy win. And they just rush, try and rush you down, and then the next minute you've tabled them by turn three. <laughs> like it does happen. Um, it it absolutely does, and it's about experience with the match. But obviously, you're also a very experienced Death Guard player, so you kind of know how to play your matchups when you come into them. Whereas a lot of players who might not have played against good Death Guard players, especially, they won't really understand how to approach the game, and as a result, they'll be caught out and make mistakes. Like. Uh, three of my game and even my fourth round opponent my opponent didn't quite uh, the elder player in my final game didn't quite understand how my list played because he hadn't played anything like it before and he'd played the triple pbc list on the first day and i think he had beaten it but then he played my list and was completely like oh wow i this is much harder for me because you know i don't know how to deal with all these plague marines running everywhere and you got um, your models out and he's like all right where's the other two pbcs <laughs> yes <laughs> yes he was like holy crap that's a lot of plague marines running across the table at me i was like yep yeah they do that <laughs> oh no <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool, man. So, um, so yeah, we'll we'll, tell, we'll wrap it up there because I don't want to take too much of your evening away from you. Um, so, I will say thank you very much for coming on. Is there anything you'd like to plug or anything like that? Uh, I'd just like to give a shout out to the folks at uh, Try Hard Wargaming. They're a great Discord if people are interested in TTS or just wanted to converse with a lot of uh, top level players. Um, there's a lot of WTC players who congregate there, discuss ideas. Um, I talk there a lot about death guard almost obsessively as well aiden you i don't need to say that you know that as well Aiden. you're also strangely obsessed with this faction of slow moving green men oh, what, uh, gave it away <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh yeah shout out to the boys at uh, team ireland 40k we're hoping to uh have another good run uh, at wtc now next year oh, well thank you very much for coming on mate thank you very much for sharing your thoughts about your lgt event and your list and obviously your thoughts your list going forward um Hopefully, we'll, we'll see you running Death Guard for a little bit longer um, because they're in a quite a nice little spot at the moment. So uh, I look forward to hopefully seeing you. Maybe one of us will get that uh, that 5-0 and o at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so, man. I hope so. I've done... The best I did was in ninth. I got a 4 uh, and a draw, and I came third that event. I was like, oh, I've, I've missed out on the 5-0 and o by like a, a fraction of points, but we'll, uh, we'll take it. Thank you so much for having me, Aiden. No, uh, honestly. Um, I, I actually quite enjoyed this. So if you'd like to... like pop back on at some point maybe we can have another chat about some other things um um i'll discuss it we are obviously off air i don't know why i'm saying this on air hi everyone yeah <laughs> but, <laughs> bye everyone <laughs> but it, was, it was it was lovely to meet you man thank you Aiden. thank you very much right. you too man hope you enjoyed it thank you very much once again for coming on base and we'll catch you all guys in the next one thank you very much and uh stay rotten bye